Shout out to Ting, our wonderful sponsor for today's show. Ting, you heard me, you son of a bitch. Ting is a killer mobile service provider that puts yours to shame. Get with it, people. I've got a special offer you're going to want to take advantage of. And when I say I, I mean the fine folks at Ting. Head on over to and type into your uh, search window, chat.ting.com, right now and open a new account and get $25 off your device or $25 in service credit just by using that URL. Again, that's chat.ting.com. Thank you, Ting. Thank you so much. And now, folks, on to the show. Welcome back once again to Kevin Pollack's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. How are you? Sorry? I didn't. Um, I am just back from Springfield, Illinois, and boy, is my Trucker's Museum tired. Sorry? Holy crap. Uh, their airport, uh, I had to tease them. I was like flying into the, I said I enjoyed flying into your international house of planes. It was, we took it for a day and a half looking for the, oh. all right. It well, was. Still, the, the acronym IHOP still works, so. Yes. They're, they're just getting avionics well, now in, in central Illinois. Give them they, they liked it when I took the piss out of them, as the, as the Brits would say. They did enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, they had a sense of humor about it. I'm but still I, mad that you didn't close the show by saying goodnight, Springton, there will be no encore. I know, I was playing in Springfield, and I totally blew the Springton ending. You really did. Shame <laughs> on you. But I, I, there weren't enough teeth. They were missing teeth, and I didn't want to. You didn't want to sail over the head. It would. It probably with would. with a Simpsons it. reference. Um, welcome back. It's show one sixty five. I couldn't be more excited, oh. and I'll tell you why. You got the buffering wheel. Look, that was great. The buffy. They did <laughs> it. They excited. were on it. This. They were ready. They got the buffering wheel. They were ready. Um, just to make sure you're on your toes, uh, those of you watching from around the world, we're streaming for the first time on the YouTube, they tell me. 165 shows is how long it took to say, all right, we'll stream on the YouTube. So uh, I think this YouTube is going places. I do too. I hear there's total strangers with uh, millions of uh, views. Like we're about to be. <laughs> right. Or hundreds. <laughs> Write to us at contact at kevinpaulchatcho.com and let us know what you think about this YouTube experience. Let us know if, how, if the sound quality is good and the picture. We're supposed to be streaming in the HD, which is not good for aging Jews. Um, I'm unbelievably excited about my guests, so I'm just going to come over to uh, the kids and see if there's anything to report. Sammy, you got uh, a birthday. Got a birthday this week. Yeah, got a birthday this week. 31 flavors. What are you going to do? 31. 31. And they said it wouldn't last. I didn't think it would Different last. Different joke. Uh, are you excited? I'm, I'm thrilled. Yeah. You know, what do you... Can I be honest with you? Please. Enjoy the fuck out of your 30s, please. I'm going to try. Yeah, because your 40s are going to be here and you're going to go, fuck, my 30s. I'm already wistful for my 20s. <laughs> no, that's what I'm trying to talk you out of. Okay. Let them go. Let them go. When you're in your 20s, you're not allowed to have a past. When you're in your mm -hmm. 20s, you say, you know, I remember, and somebody says, shut up. Yeah, I don't no, give I a shit what you think you remember 20s. I agree. Yeah. So now you're legitimate. Okay. All right. Thanks for the tip. Are you enjoying your pilot season? Oh my God, it's the best ever. Mm -hmm. Ha, are you kidding? Yeah. Just eight, nine offers a week. Well. I really don't know what to do with myself. I understand. Yeah. Uh, so you've read nothing that blows your mind. No, no, no it's, it's going nowhere fast. <laughs> well, nowhere fast. that's your typical pilot season mm. for, your, for your average actor. What are you gonna do? I got uh, very lucky because a guest I had on the show offered me a, a sweet little deal. And so um, yeah. I've just, we just had our first little rehearsal mm. with the Barry Sonnenfeld, which was fun. Um, and it's, yeah, the Beverly Hills Cop pilot is happening. I can't wait to not be in that one either. I can't wait to see uh, how much fun it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. You see it? You sense it? Yeah. I'll act better in the show. Jamie. Yes. Um, I've well, had the Michael McDonald song, Sweet Freedom, 
stuck in my head for three days. Yeah, and it I just, can't get everyone it out. sing while you're yawning, and you'll you'll do Michael McDonald. Yes. Uh, you can't get it out. Can't get it out. Oh man, that's brutal. It's it's been pretty brutal. That's uh, all I got to report. I'm going to be doing a talk <laughs> and walk and live at South by Southwest on Tuesday. For those of you that give a shit about that sort of thing, we're coming to you uh, on the on the uh, new uh, comedy, uh, well, new to us, great uh, comedy podcast network, Earwolf. I'm unbelievably excited about the new alliance. Uh, they are, we are now part of their family. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit, but let me get to my guest. Won't you please get the fuck out of the way? Thank you. Jesus. Um, we met... Unlike when I sat across from John Hamm, and he had to remind me that we met. Played nine holes of golf with John Hamm, didn't remember. Uh, Mr. Handsome made no, no real impression on me at all. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test, test my guest to see if he remembers where we've met the first time. But there, there, were, there were several hangs, and we're going to get to most of them. Um, so actor... Be, uh, improviser, become actor, actor, become writer, uh, and then uh, director, and then got to eat at the main table now for the last several years. And um, is holy... That you, is that what you call this, the main table? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, made it. Seems, it seems odd. <laughs> yeah. It seems odd for me to say it. It's like Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> this storied... Pine. <laughs> yes. Pine is correct. Is it pine? By the way, yeah. We it's went for oak, pine. and they said you should go with the been, pine. That's been, that's been copyrighted. Yeah. Uh, John Forever, welcome. So, yeah. um, Long time coming. Do you... Oh, buddy. Do you... Um, you were very kind to reach back. Yes. I had reached out initially. Yes. And you had a, uh, a career uh, that was a little crazy in the moment. Yes. Yeah. Gets busy at times. It gets Thank insane, God. and you're in the middle of something right now, Thank too. God. Yes, right? I am. Are you but in prep? Prep, getting ready to shoot a pilot. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> it seems like everybody's got one. It's like really? Susan Lucci with, walking around with the Emmys. Remember that on SNL? Yes. Everybody had an Emmy but her. Um, uh, yeah, getting ready to do a, a, About a Boy oh, pilot right. uh, for that. NBC. So, uh, but that's going to be shooting in about a week. In town, how, how wonderful is that to shoot in Los Angeles? It was in the email from Sean Ryan. He said, you oh. only have to work a couple of days. It shoots in town. You don't take that for granted No anymore. other show does. Pilots especially. I know. Um, you've, you've, I've noticed through the dossier that you've, uh, you've done several of these pilots, which is a yeah. sweet deal for a director because you own a piece in perpetuity, right? It is, it is nice. It's a good, it's a, it's a, it's, it's definitely your, your, you know, you get your lottery ticket. Sure. Uh, what's really nice about it is that you get to work for a short amount of time. Right. With all new people, right? And you get to sort of jump in there and try things you wouldn't normally do on a full feature. Different way of photographing, work with a different assistant director, different actors. Right. So it, it, work is always good and forces you to grow. And I remember I was doing, actually we were talking about it, I had done an episode, uh, Judd had reached out to me years ago to see if I wanted to do an episode of Undeclared. It was one that you weren't on. No, it was right after. It was right after. It was the <clears throat> last episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, why not? And that led to me doing a pilot with Judd that didn't go, which led to me uh, being offered Elf, wow. which led to a lot of great things for me as a director. So. Work is always good. Just the, I think you should always take work when you the can. The pilot you did for Judd that didn't go yes. is ultimately a piece of the bridge that led yes. to Elf. Yes. Because one of the things I was looking for in the dossier was uh, that bridge. That was the bridge. Be Judd, Judd Apatow was the bridge. Because that was... Because Jimmy Miller worked right. with him and worked with Will Ferrell. And I was, hired as a, I was hired as a writer for Elf for like a year before it went. And then with the hopes that I would direct if it went. And I did. Wow. Because that was a big change of gears. Yeah. And... Um, well, it was a hit. <laughs> and so it, it, that, that's all anybody cares about in well, Hollywood. If you have a hit or a miss, they don't care if it's good or not good. No, absolutely. If it's a hit, that yeah. opens a door. If yeah. it's a miss. Yeah. If it's a miss that's good, it still, is, it still works to your favor. Yeah. Uh, and when it's a bad and a miss, then, it's, then you get time out. For sure. But, I mean, it, it was the first uh, big studio comedy hit uh, for Will Ferrell yes. also. Yes, kind of. Um, it wasn't before he. The only movie that he, I think I think like Night at the Roxbury was before, right. right? Then, then he shot Old School with Vince. Right. So I was aware, and actually on the set of that, but that wasn't out yet. Right. While we we're filming Elf, that came out and blew up. 
right. but that was a hard R. And so there was a little bit of, of uh, you know, him coming out in a PG Christmas movie on the heels of that, were, was he sort of building on the trajectory? Yeah. And so there was a lot of hand-wringing about I'm what's sure. the personality of Elf gonna be, because it could have been a darker film, and there was often talk of that. Right. But I, I felt very strongly it should be a family-friendly PG film, and it, sh it just showed a, a side of, uh, of, of Will, and a lot of people in the improv community. Right. You know, there's a lot of people I had worked with in Chicago that popped Amy up. Amy Sedaris. Amy Sedaris. <gasps> Isn't she great? Oh, she's, she's so good. Great she's... guest, too. I don't know if you've ever had her. She's just... just would love to. YouTube, YouTube her and see her appearances. She oh, no, just we're insane fans. Stitches, stitches people up. I mean, people at home, too. You no, know, every time she's on Letterman, Letterman oh. I stop whatever I'm doing. It has to happen. I have to, yeah. She just is... But just, Slices and dices you like in person, and she's just so quick. She's and I remember, so fast. and I used to be at Second City doing dishes and well, being a host. Was she was on stage in the back with Colbert, and with uh, Paul Danello, and uh, and um, who, who else? Uh, uh, Steve Carell. Steve Carell was on stage. They were all in one company. Jesus. And so I got to watch them every. That's like the experience a lot of people have working the door at a comedy club. That right. was me. I was working at Second City. And, right. and then Farley and you know all the great great people of that generation. And never knowing lightning would strike yet again after how many generations it hit right. in, in uh, Second City. So in, in retrospect, I was there for, for yet another golden age. Well, let's talk about just that one little uh, moment in time where you have that sense memory of your experience at Second City and what Amy was on that stage yeah. and what she meant, and then you, as a director, saying, "I'd love you to come play in this film." It's great. It's great because you could you realize that you've got sort of a, a deep bench of people that you know that you can draw from. Right. That not only are you sort of reaching out to them, but but you're benefiting so much because you're inheriting all this skill and even little parts. Matt Walsh did a cameo yeah. there as being interviewed, like l just small little things that that pop up throughout. Andy Richter, who I had known from the improv community in Chicago, was there. And the new people that they know, right. like Kyle Gass, there's a million great little pieces of casting that have, you know, over time flowered into their own careers yeah. uh, apart from that. Well, the standout for me on Elf that I was... Uh, and a kid named Jimmy Kahn. A little kid mm -hmm. named Jimmy Kahn, who um, I had the pleasure of working with as well. Um, the thing, the difference for me with with Will Ferrell and Elf, the biggest difference was it, it was really the first time the movie was on his back. On That's his true. Shoulders. That is true. And you're 100 percent right to go from that hard R breakout, giant Animal House type embracement yes. to this wonderful Christmas yeah, yeah. PG movie. And you know, there's been these moments as a writer uh, and producer, you were there for Vince on Swingers. Yes. This great, great friend of yours who you saw and knew right. in your heart was breakout. It yeah, was, sure. It was, it was not if, it was a matter of time. Right. And then with RDJ. Yeah. Arguably yeah. the greatest comeback yes. in the history of mankind. Forget show if, business. If you count from where he was to where he is, <laughs> yeah. that's a big, well, big amplitude a there. Well, he was in 12-year-old's bed in Malibu, I think, <laughs> goes the story. The last time <laughs> I love live streaming, but I, we can't. <laughs> yeah. I just have to sit here like like. But 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 honestly, I, he is a hero of mine. Yes. Because life doesn't uh, often show you the door as much as you can show yourself that door. You know, uh, people yeah. who go through various programs talk about hitting the bottom. Yes. And and we those of us who've loved him from the first time we saw him saw him keep hitting that bottom. And then he finally kind of got to that place where I think just about everyone, but in fact, Mel Gibson, who, who yeah. was still giving him a, a big thumbs up and whatnot, um, everyone was kind of like, it was a heartbreak. It was a heartbreak because it just seemed to be over. So of course you've been asked, but I have to know, what is that like when you finally get your shot to do Iron Man and RDJ is your guy? Yeah, You know was... it. You that know was, he's the it, guy. It was, a, it was one of the, now Iron Man like now is big business, but at the time it was sort of a pilot film for a new studio trying to frugally make a film as a negative pickup that would be distributed by a studio. Okay. Uh, trying to follow the model of what they had done at Marvel with their partnership with Fox. Right. Keep costs to a certain level. Uh, don't make it cast reliant 
use the heroes and the Marvel characters as the brand, have a good trailer, try to make as good of a movie as you can, but do it within your means. And so Robert was not an obvious choice for that, but uh, I remember he came in, had a, sat with him, had an interview with him, and uh, I just saw in his eyes that he was ready, and he was like, this is me. It's about a guy that's going through similar things than he did off screen. Yeah. A guy who had not made the most of his opportunities and had been handed the keys to the kingdom at a younger age and didn't know what to do with them, and now it's about second chances. Right. And for me it was great because I can't relate directly to a story about a kid in high school like Peter Parker. Right. I remember what it was like, uh, but I, I, don't, I can't bring anything personal to it. Right. And with Robert, understanding what dealing with fame, uh, being in the public eye, living a life yes. on private planes, I've seen enough of that. I've gotten a glimpse of it, and he certainly knew what it was to be at the top and the bottom. And when you embarrass yourself, yeah. it's, you're not just doing it yeah. like I did in college. Right. You, know, it was, you know, it's in front of people because he was stage. already. So th it's a very humbling thing. And, and, and Tony Stark had gone through those things. Yeah. And Robert knew enough from his own experience how to bring some truth to it. And I knew if I could have him, I would have my, I understood what the whole movie should be. And, and could I have done it without him? Would have been different. I don't, it definitely would not have hit that chord. And then when he came on board, you realized how many people were so excited to see this moment. Right. Both in the curiosity of the fans, but also people like Gwyneth Paltrow, Jeff Bridges. We got a cast beyond anything that we could have anticipated because people just were excited to be there for that partnership. When he was back. When he's back. And then he just, you know, he just, you know, destroyed it and has benefited well, and grown The partnership that brand. between, well, he's arguably the biggest box office guy now in the world. Uh, the partnership between the two of you allowed for what I believe was the difference between another comic book hero movie and a whole new generation, yeah. which was humor and humanity. The two of you brought both of those right. in such a way to a comic book setting yeah. that didn't exist before. Just we, didn't exist. We struck a tone that borrowed a lot from the independent film background that we both had. Right. And what was so nice about it, unlike Elf, you know, Elf was a comedy, and I had a great time on Elf, and it's, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more proud of what we were all able to do and the fact that we're part of the Christmas rotation is oh. beyond, that's the high, if you had asked me, yes. I would have told you, that's what we were shooting for. Like, I want to be part, I want to be in there with Christmas Story and It's a Wonderful Life every year. Yeah. I want to be part of the fabric. Please. And we are, you yeah. know, and that was, a, that's huge. That was a, 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 that people tweet pictures of, I'm, I, I've just shown it to my, my yeah. four-year-old loves oh. it and I love it with, you know, that's how I remember watching Mel Brooks movies yeah. with, my, with my dad. Like oh, him yeah. laughing at Blazing Saddles and me only understanding half the jokes, laughing my ass off. To me, that's a bonding experience between generations. I remember with my father, watching him and, laugh at the farting around the campfire. Yeah. Something I'll never forget. And to me, that's like, you know, that's Citizen Kane to yeah. this day. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, um, and so to have that be Elf was, was, was a big thing. But the experience of making Elf, because it was a comedy, everybody has an opinion about comedy. Oh, boy. And sometimes you're balancing st between story and comedy, and sometimes you have to defend cutting a joke, mm. which is, you know, s to some people sacrilege. Right. Some people understand it, and to some people it's let's get the best joke for the story and the character. Right. And everybody has a different, it's a sliding scale that everybody has a different opinion, but everybody, and you could have people who are experts in comedy and very funny people who just have different styles of doing it sometimes. And I don't, I'm not good at defending my comedy. I don't understand how to, it's hard to say why I like one joke or another. And I remember seeing on the laser disc of Tootsie, there was so many conversations uh, that happened between Dustin Hoffman and Cindy, uh, Sidney Pollack about what jokes should be in or not. Like him whistling for the cab in the man's voice was, right. I remember, if I'm remembering correctly, one where one did want it, one didn't want it. He put it in, got a big laugh and ultimately felt good about including that gag, right. but it could have potentially hurt the reality of the film. That's right. And so you're constantly playing, negotiating over what the tone of the piece is gonna be. And it's good to have a balance between various people who have different tastes. And do you love that puzzle? I, I, I do love it, and I like to work with people with strong opinions right. uh, about things that could balance things out. Right. Um, but with comedy, because I don't come from a background of working a writer's room, uh, being a stand-up, I kind of have an instinct and it's hard to defend always what I want to do. And, and so I had a much easier time 
like on Iron Man where it's not a comedy, but I could make it as funny or not as I want, and since it's not called a comedy, the humor's not challenged. If a joke misses, it's a drama. If half the people get the joke, it's okay. Yeah. But if you're doing a sitcom, sure. and not every joke nails the, yeah, the they, test wheel, yeah. you're, not, you're not doing a good job for, for those people. That's because a you're, great uh, way to articulate that. Do you know what I mean? That. Absolutely. And so I think that the, t the sense of the humor uh, in Iron Man was very similar to like in Swingers or something where sometimes it could get, be there, sometimes it can't, sometimes it could go over the head, sometimes it's subtle. It never felt subtle. forced, and it was about no. the character's charm. Yeah. And the reason I said humor and humanity is because his humanity came from his sense of humor in such yes. a big way. Not just his generosity that you would see in small moments. Um, but they weren't jokes, they were Robert oh, doing his thing. And that's, to me, that's my greatest, that's to me, as a director, the most fun. Whether it's, as you mentioned, Vince or, or, um, or Will, them to bring their, the best version of what they do. Mm. And maybe a flavor of it that they have and didn't do before. Oh, but yeah. it was always in them. It's never me saying, do it like this. It's always trying to be a midwife to what they do well and then just casting really, really good people, which a lot of that comes from conversations that we had both on Dinner for Five and Prior. when I think we met in Toronto, yeah. did we meet through yeah. Penelope? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just kept picking your brain about these Scorsese stories. And I remember you telling it on the show. I could tell, I've told your story. Uh, I would have said more than you have until the podcast, but I've heard it a few times on the podcast. <laughs> but I've told this story so many times about the muffin scene where Scorsese was coming to you with no agenda after you did a take and yeah. saying, how do you want to do it? And you said, I don't know, and trying to figure out if he had an agenda. He didn't. You said, maybe mad. All right, let's try it that way. Yeah. I took that so much as a, I, I created this whole image of what Marty was like just from picking your brain about that story on several occasions, right. on air and off, and try to emulate that as a director. Because there's different types of directors. There's certain ones who are wordsmiths, yeah. who yeah. want to help you t turn the phrase, or they want you to emulate their style of speech. Some people who it's about rhythm and music, and right. some people where it's about trying to cull out of your performer the best version of them that matches the material and adjusting the material if it doesn't match the person. Well, that's the thing. You know, I, I actually, when Iron Man opening weekend happened, I am sh probably do or don't remember, I don't know, but I had to pick up the phone and call you. And I, I sensed that I was calling it not the best time, whether yeah. you guys were on your way out. There, there was some sort of movement and action it's appreciated, though, in the always. background. But I, I, I had never done that before. Really? Honestly, or since. I felt really? compelled. Yeah, because you, part of it was I didn't have access to RDJ to say yeah. how madly in love I was with yeah. his moment in yeah. time. Yes, for sure. Uh, but, you know, and I tried to express in the moment of you've just come to the big boy table. You've just... With all the success of Elf and everything else, this was... Uh, we were made. Yeah. It was like being made at so, the time, yeah. So what I'm interested in today, if you don't mind, is something we, we were just kind of talking about, which is bringing out the best in naturally yes. charming, brilliant yes. superstars. Yes. Because Vince has worked with a lot of directors, Will's worked with a lot of directors, and so has RDJ. And I would argue, you hold up the three performances that you just happen to be involved in, and then I want to hear arguments about where they hit the ball better. Well, that's very kind. Um, well, I think I think I'm with a, I think with I think with a lot of them, it's just a, 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 a having the patience to work through their process right. with them. Right. Because with Vince, once he got that performance, it was like it, it was like opening up something that he had, and he's done. I would argue as well or better later. You look at him in Crashers, great. Yeah, sure. I, he tickles me in everything I see. Even stuff, I think I'm his biggest fan of his comedy because I'm laughing at stuff other people. I'll, I'll blurt out laughter at places other people in the audience aren't. Of course. Because there's, a certain, there's a certain thing. H but His rhythm and music and dancing in Clay Pigeon may be oh, yeah. the funkiest fun. But he found his, I think he was trying to fit into, because he came out very young, and I think he was trying to audition and be what other people wanted him to be. Right. Because when you're that good looking, he's a movie star, and then to 
have the chops of a character actor is not something people know how to fit a box, they fit you until they see you do it, and then they build a box around you. Right. So he was that guy. And once he was able to do that and see that he could free flow that, yeah. it, it was like he, he got his wings uh, and, and then was able to now create his own material and his own, his own movies and write and, and, and produce and do it all. So, so sometimes it's like pulling a, a thorn out of a lion's foot. Sure. You know, and sometimes it's like with, with, with Will, it's more like, and remember, it's me and Will. It wasn't just me and Will. It's me and Will. Adam McKay was there. Oh boy. They were trying to do Anchorman right. before Elf, right. and they got, uh, it, it got Push breaks. Down. So now Adam McKay, who was all gearing up to direct this thing before he was a big guy, right. was, uh, you know, process-oriented enough to work with his buddy and me and work the script and be this great partner and have writing sessions. And, and I know McKay from Chicago also. He sure. was sort of the generation after me when they were forming Upright Citizens Brigade and all that. I was there for that moment too. Wow. So to have him as part of it, a lot of the irreverence in the elf, there's a little subversive humor that digs its way into a PG movie. A lot of that's the personality of those two together yeah. and I loved it. Yeah. I thought it was so, so funny and great and tried to encourage it and actually include a lot of that stuff. So with, with, with Will, there's a real partnership between him, Jimmy Miller, that whole camp, and then there was Scott Armstrong, another writer, David Berenbaum, who wrote the original script. So that was more of a takes a village. But on day to day, I was always trying to find the emotional through line to this character because it, not a lot of movies did that right. Mm. I looked at Tootsie, I looked at Being There, I looked at Steamboat Bill Jr. You know, you look at the people who did it well and you say, why does this work? and not other films that try to do this kind of gag. Right. And it usually has to do with making the character play at the top of their intelligence, with something Bel Del Close always said in Chicago, was even if the character seems like an idiot, they're trying as hard as they could to be smart. And within their context, they're smart. So there'd be little things like the PA would announce something when he was in Gimbals, and he would be scared looking around of what the hell is that, because to this primitive right. man, that is the voice of God. So there's all sorts of little moments that we would discover either together or separately of little opportunities to bring humanity and vulnerability, but a lot of heart to that character too. So he is like Rudy. He's going to push through yeah. and arc every character around him right. instead of him crumbling. Yeah. So uh, that's always a very forceful, fun type of trajectory to play. And he just, there was just something about that visual and him, and you know him, he's a very big hearted, nice, sweet guy who plays gruff characters, yeah. but you like the gruff characters because you could see through the character and see that he's actually got a big heart. Yeah, he has an instantaneous and infectious uh, love that you, you can't get away from. Yeah, he's just a good dude. Yeah. And he was a very trusting, great partner, and we both grew a lot, and it was a scary moment for him. He was hitting mm. in the midst of it. So, you know, I was sort of there, and we were cloistered away up in, up in Vancouver, uh, doing it, but that was, you know, it was a very special moment to be uh, sharing his life, going to work, and it was, again, those early movies, you're under the gun so much to just make your days and, yeah. and do it that it's not like we were sitting around enjoying it. We were just no, in a there's day, no way. you know, you're wringing your hands and you're worried about the thing and all the visual effects and the forced perspective and, right. and then notes coming in from other cities and here's some pages and let's try to work this joke in and uh, so, so that was a. It was. It, it was had a, to have been the biggest circus at that point in terms of all the plates spinning that you've just lived. Well, they all built. Uh, I mean, I went from sw Swingers to, to Maid to then Elf. Elf was only about thirty. You know, it's a bit huge budget for me because Maid was five, I think. Well, or yeah. Six, right. And then after that was Athura, which was I think sixty or something. So they all got incrementally bigger, and then Iron Man. So. I kind of climbed the ladder budget-wise, so I always was ready for the next step to, to have more responsibility. I want to talk about your dad's influence early on yes. uh, with your movie-going uh, uh -huh. initial habits and, and rituals and traditions. Uh, but first, this moment from our new partners at Earwolf. Friends, do you know anyone who doesn't hate their mobile service provider? I don't. Luckily, Ting, that's Ting is here to make everything right again. 
Don't keep screwing yourself over with shady companies, bloating your phone bill, and dodging your calls. Time for a revolution, and Ting is the answer. Ting, a nationwide, no BS mobile service that makes sense. Believe it or not, not only contract free, but has zero termination fees, absolutely no bundling, and no ride along services. They've got service levels from XS to double XL for voice minutes text messages, and megabytes of data. Select what works for you and ditch the rest. Sounds pretty good, don't it? Scrap all the add-on charges for basic services like hotspot, three-way calling, call forwarding, and voicemail. With Ting, everything is included. Everything is included. No sneaky fees, no mystery line items in your bill. Plus, Ting has incredible online account maintenance and no hold customer support. Log on to the following, chat.ting.com. Do it now. Open your account, and you can get $25 off your service or $25 in service credit using that URL. I'm going to repeat it, chat.ting.com. Thanks for that deal, Ting. Go snatch it up, people. So long. Who doesn't love Star Trek? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love Captain Kirk? I found Captain myself Kirk? on stage last night actually getting lost in a Shatner moment where I thought, this is why I fell in love with this lunatic when I was a kid. Because uh -huh. I actually thought, this actor is crazy. When I would watch it, I would, I would step out you're of the about show. The, you're talking about the original yeah, of episodes course. of Star Trek? Okay. I would step out of the show and I would think, William Shatner, the actor, yes. who's portraying Captain Kirk, yes. himself is crazy. Like a fox. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay, so uh, through the research that J-Mac was kind enough to amass for me, uh, yes. uh, I was th uh, thrilled and kind of moved that your dad was taking you to see yes. Kurosawa films. Yes. Scorsese. yes. How old are you now when this is happening? Seven, You know, it was the divorced years, so I'll it say. was probably uh, seven to 12 and then maybe older even then, so yeah, from the earliest years of seven, and usually, you know, I, I usually figure it out by looking at when those films were released. But I would go to revival houses, so I didn't see, I didn't see Godfather one and two when it first came out. I saw it like in the revival houses in Greenwich Village with my dad. Sure. Uh, but West Side Story. Um, but these are all. This is all his idea. Yeah. Yeah. Don, I want be you a, to come with me and see. Well, that's been my film school ever since, too. I mean, I had, you know, if you look on the refrigerator and swingers, I got a New Beverly schedule. That was really my life. I was, you know, it was well, pre-VCRs when sure. I was first seeing the stuff. If you didn't catch it in the theaters when it came out and it wasn't on TV, you weren't seeing that thing. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, I remember Kurosawa. There was always, you know, there's always the, the things that had an edge to, like, the promise of violence. Yes. Those are the ones that you're sort of sitting forward. And little do you know you're actually getting indoctrinated into classic movie making. Right. You know, because the samurai films were great because that was, you know, you couldn't get more brutal and more compelling, uh, you know, uh, showdowns than that. Right. I just loved the samurai movies so right. much, so much. And, and then... Uh, but how amazing to take a seven, eight-year-old to... Yeah, to... I was a little older for those. Uh, okay. Younger, I went to on broad, to Broadway with him. Yeah, he would take you to the uh, standing room only. Yeah. You guys would stand in, in the saw back. saw Grease a bunch of times, yeah. Frank Langella and Dracula. Uh, yeah, and, and so instantly that thing, that live thing on stage, is that grabbing you also? I do like it. You know, and I would do school plays, so there's, you know, there's that mix that where you're half excited, half jealous. Yeah. It's a good mix. Yeah. But I think so much of it is, I guess what I don't under, didn't understand at the time and now do that, that I'm a dad is you're, you're forming your opinion based on what you're watching with who you're watching it. Yeah. So you're getting cues from your old man. You know, the first round was Mel Brooks and Woody Allen. Sure. Sleeper, mm -hmm. Blazing Saddles. He's got the nose. He's got the nose. Yeah. And I was, you know, laughing, seeing him laugh. You're imprinting. Yeah. You're not judging. You think you are, but you're imprinting. And you now have this with your son. Now I have it with my son. Yeah. And you realize that those moments, you know, it's going to, I, uh, we, we saw The Sting together. I took him to see The Sting last night. And I'll, I usually start the same way. Like, at a theater? At a theater. At the, at the Arrow at Theater the Arrow, yeah. in, uh, in, in, in Santa well, Monica. We saw, well, what was John presenting, Jamie, when we saw him at the Arrow? It was, was a black and white... Uh... No, no, no. We, that, it wasn't at the Arrow, but it was... Um, they had a piano accompaniment, Buster Keaton. A Buster, Buster Keaton, Keaton. Yeah. I, I've shown, I, I've shown I've, sp I've spoken about Buster Keaton a lot. Yeah. I, love, I, love, I used to go see Buster Keaton at the silent movie before I made Swingers. 
I would go to the silent movie theater on Fairfax. Fairfax, yeah. Because when you see silent comedies with a live audience and a live organ player, it doesn't miss a beat. No. Especially Chaplin and Keaton. Right. Uh, Lloyd, pretty good. You know, some of the others, hit or miss. Right. Um, and it's, it's just a great way to expose. And I looked at Buster Keaton a lot. If I ever want to look at how to frame and stage, uh, especially physical comedy, without cuts, whether it's Will in Elf bouncing off the couch, jumping on the tree and the tree smashing down, getting all that timing to work within the frame, or Robert Downey smashing into the ceiling while he's testing his boots. Those are all very classic, you know, two-reeler, gags right and it's great to study just like a painter would look at the old masters sometimes it's great to pull those apart and you could always rely on cuts and music and sound effects and things but if you could get it to work in that frame mm. it, it just it becomes like a, a a test to see if i can make the gag work like they did you know because they were so good and then you realize what they were up against and they there was nobody doing it before them right here i'm copying a lot of the times or re at least referencing a gag or a rhythm Right. Uh, yeah, they, they, had they had stage nothing. shows, you know, vaudeville and whatnot. Sure. That, but it was live theater. Well, Keaton so they grew had up no, in it. They had no composition, as you said. Right. It was a proscenium. Yeah. So, but then they started working the frame, and you saw that Buster Keaton, masterful. You know, masterful Chaplin, and the tradition. Then I realized because my in was probably the early work of, of uh, Woody Allen, yeah. which there was a lot of that in and Sleeper and that, and he drew from Chaplin a lot and. And then you start to, there's a, a this sort of subgenre of the writer slash filmmaker slash actor that is flowering now with Lena Dunham, Louis C.K., Larry David. There's a, there's a specific subgroup yeah. uh, that, that threads through. And that's, that's where my, that's to me, and, I, and with Swingers, I got to be part of that baton pass and yeah. it's and it and it's the it's the one I miss the most now and the one really that in in now that I kind of could pick what I want to do there's a definitely a a, a a a siren song drawing me to that again that's I, something I'd love to mess around with now. I would think so yeah the the startling thing looking back at the at the swingers experience a rejected at Sundance did not know yes. that found that startling yeah and for any young filmmakers out there who put who, who, who put all their eggs in the Sundance basket yeah imagine that and I and by the way I back Sundance because it was not a it was a tape and it wasn't finished and right. I had conversations subsequently but well, I'm sure they but had the big thing reasons. was the big thing was the disappointment Exactly. Of thinking that that was the be all and end all, yes. Um, but um, have been there since, and of course. still think it's the most relevant and right. important I for the history for of independent your, film. Yeah, for your personal, but for my personal journey in the moment. Well, not getting into Second City. Also, I never performed on stage there, so all the things, all the big doors slammed in my face. You know, and lots very of very pivotal moments. Yeah, and um, but that's good training. Jersey Boys just fell apart a few months ago. It happened still. Wow. I was supposed to direct that. So you don't, and I think being an actor teaches you good lessons in resilience and understanding that sometimes the best things that happen to you are the worst things, and sometimes the worst things are the best things. And Yeah, I mean, as a stand-up, I'm going to liken it to I, I, can, I can never get away from either a routine a moment or an evening falling flatter than I had intended. That will continue to happen no matter how long and masterful I think I might be on that stage. Yeah. It's something that I can look forward to. And so instead of experiencing each one of those as, what the hell am I going to do now? No, they're growth. Oh, they're, they're growth spurts. Yeah. That's when it all, uh, when, when it's going good, that's about dealing with the uh, anxiety of all the success, figuring it out, having a lot of energy coming towards you, being now grateful, yeah. right? When, in the dark moments, that's when you grow. Yeah. It's like when you sleep, your brain metabolizes all of your, you know, all these experiences and changes its neuroplasticity to change yeah. your identity as a person. And then you come out as a transformed 
next step version of you that's going to be equipped for the next leg of the journey. I hate that all the cliches about you learn more from failure than success are so fucking true, but there's no way around yeah, no, it. Yeah, no, that's true. Because you're having your metal tested. It, it, sometimes it's nothing more than that. How much can you withstand? For, 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 for me. Yeah. No, there are certain people, there are the Babe Ruths of the world, though, you know, where it's, they're just on a, in the Larry Birds, where they have a certain talent and yeah. they exceed at one, excel at one thing, and it's about just achieving greatness in that one area. And but usually those people are sort of on on a on a rocket trajectory down one path. Yeah. For people like me, and I would group you in from how I know you, it's about that finding different. Yeah, the water finds its own path down to the sea through everything, and and you have to embrace that riding that through and finding your path through it. Um, otherwise, you're just going to get in your own way too much, and there's nothing, there's nothing worse than bitterness or um, frustration, because you can screw up your own story. For sure, and cynicism. I think I've spoken about it before, but when Conan uh, left The Tonight Show, his last broadcast uh, during that brief tenure was saying, there's no place for cynicism in all this. I refuse yeah. to allow it to set in. and. And, um, for and that was show. a guy struggling, you know, oh with it. God, yes. As a person, you know. And the most subversive comedy in late night yeah. uh, at the time or arguably to this right. day. Right, and subversive comedy is usually built on a foundation of some type of anxiety or feeling yeah. that, you know, you're reacting to the world in a way that you're not necessarily trustful towards what the universe has to offer. And that leads to a type of comedy. And as you grow out of it, Right. That's always very interesting to me to watch those transitions as people attain life's lessons that change them or having a kid right. or, you know, I know you're not big on kids. That's not your big, <laughs> that's not your big one. That, I'm, you know, all, I'm in favor of children. You like them, but your whole thing was if you hear a baby crying on a plane, right? Wasn't that, wasn't that one of your bits? I might have mentioned that, but I didn't write the bit. Oh, you didn't? Well, I mean, I didn't come up with this analogy with it, but if I... If you hear a baby crying on a plane, if yeah, you're if like, you're, I should help that your baby. your first reaction is, oh, that poor child, <laughs> then you should have children. If your first reaction is... What, what, what's what he doing Paul in first Lynn, class? Yeah, what, what Paul Lynn once said, drunk, oh, said drunk in first class. Do you know that story? No, no, no. Oh, God. The baby was drunk in first class. <laughs> the baby was, should have been drunk. Paul Lynn's drunk in first class is 100 years ago. And it was some coast to coast or maybe even to Europe long flight. Yes, he yes. just wants to drink himself into a stupor sure. and go to sleep and the baby won't stop. And he allegedly cried out, somebody shut that kid up before I fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> just that's horrible. Not, that's this not, singular, worst, most heinous thing. That's not what a center square should say. No. <laughs> um, were you aware... I will say, before we get into it, can I talk about Freaks and Geeks for a second? Please! We're talking about Mike. So I try to turn my kid on to, uh, looking for things that I could experience with my, yeah. with my, with my children, uh, especially my oldest son, who's, who's uh, preteen. Uh, so I, I remembered, for some reason, um, super bad being not such a hard R. Uh, so I was like, hey, let me, you know, oh, I, no. I could not have ripped the Apple TV out of the wall fast enough. <laughs> Uh, on that one. So I was like, well, no, no, not this one. It, it, we literally got like two lines of dialogue in. Okay, Daddy remember that one wrong. Um, but uh, we went to, uh, uh, on Netflix. Yeah. It, uh, I'm not getting anything for any of this, but you know, maybe it'll... Maybe I think that's how we watch Maybe we'll get the Netflix, bit, right? no? No, you had to get rent them because they only recently came on streaming. Oh, okay. I remember Jed had talked about because of the music rights, it was very hard to get that on DVD because right. I was working on Undeclared. I had yeah. not seen Freaks and Geeks. Uh, and I downloaded it. I said, hey, take a look. If we, maybe this is something we could watch together to get him off of YouTube for a second. Not that YouTube's not wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, uh, great peer-to-peer -peer sharing. But, but you know, when you some, have an 11-year-old, there's But take only, a minute, you yeah. know, take a breather. Let's try to bond a little bit. The next and, step and, is go and, outside and throw the ball around. And with the, yeah, well, let's not get nuts. But we, we, maybe online we sure. could throw the ball around. Uh, but... Uh, but we looked at it, and my family sat down and watched it, and uh, hooked. Oh, yeah. Episode one, hooked, and it was like it was so it was like finding the Dead Sea Scrolls. Also, mm. because you see who was on the show, oh, all the people that came out of it. It was like the center of the Big Bang. Yeah. Wait, Between Paul uh, Feig and Judd and Jason and Seth and all these people that I know and have worked with, and Franco. It was, Franco. Oh, oh my God! Everybody, you know, just go down go down the list. 
Sam? And, so, and you know, there's always got to be one dud. But <laughs> not at all. So that actually is. I, we started watching. So I started now getting the point where, come on, kids, let's watch. And then uh, there were, you know, uh, we were running out of time. I, I started binge watching it on my own. <laughs> and I watched the whole series. I watched the whole series right. in like an unhealthy amount of time. <laughs> and I say, talk about a, a show that never jumped the shark that was moving, inspiring, and that was exactly the age I was. The music was perfect. Wow. I was in both groups. <laughs> We've heard a lot of that. I was, a, I was a geek and a freak. Well, you sort of transitioned from one right. to the other. Uh, and just so, uh, so spot on, thoughtful. And I was just kept shooting Judd uh, texts all through it, saying, oh my God, you know, this is amazing. He yeah. says, he, he's like, watch him slow. Because there's only a few, <laughs> and some of them we really did right, and 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 boy was he right. And then uh, and I reached out to Paul also. I was like, man, it's like what you did with me. Yeah. And by the way, Seinfeld made that call to me after Swingers, and it was, it, it's a it's a moment you'll never forget when right. your peers reach out when they have not, when nothing's in it for them, and right. except to say, at a boy, and so it was just sort of, especially with Freaks and Geeks, which is how many a decade ago, yeah. uh, it, it, it. But still, you want to reach out, and and we do. It is nice when when. People are gracious. Uh, I know that it really, there's a lot of competitiveness in our, in, in our business and, you know, award season just passed and there's all the good and the bad of, of human nature. Yeah. But when somebody reaches out and tries to encourage you, either when you're doing well or doing bad, it's, it's, uh, it goes a long way. It's powerful. Yeah. Um, on the swingers front, were you, was it brought to your attention by agents? Because according to the dossier, uh, there was a moment in time where someone or several people were interested in buying the script and, and an agent of yours yes. uh, said, uh, I think this is really special and you ought to hold on to it. And, yeah, and not. Cynthia Shelton was right. her name. Uh, and and she, uh, I was doing table reads trying to get financing, right? but also to try to show the actors that I had, had in mind, including Vince and Ron Livingston, uh, uh, Alex Desaire. Patrick Van Horn, trying to get them exposed to the people who might make it to give them a shot. Right. Because I based so much on, at least in my mind, these were the people I was thinking of. And, uh, and the reading went so well that the agent was like, let's try and make this thing. Well, was there ever a moment, uh, because I don't know if, if I'm feeling this way, because Swingers set off a wave, or there, there must have been a wave before Swingers, of struggling actors or struggling comedians saying, well, I'm going to write kind of what I've been going through. Yeah, there was a bit of that. There and, always is that. Yeah, because it, I remember you were saying in one of the interviews that when you were writing it, it hadn't dawned on you that you were writing your story. You no, were just no, writing no, no. That's at right. all. Yes. It wasn't autobiography. I didn't move it enough away from me. I thought I did. Right. Because I'm not a stand-up. Yeah. I was an improviser, right. and I didn't, that wasn't, that wasn't Vince's car, that was my car. And I didn't live in that apartment, I lived in that apartment. But it was enough, and we never went to Vegas, uh, and I changed our names. But there was enough in it that it felt like I was showing my life. Right. And you know, as an actor, you're always gonna be using an aspect of your personality that you're gonna exaggerate to play any character. Right, but right. I just meant, when you, it's, it's su such a um, seminal, experience now in in the film making vernacular in the quotable one of the more quotable films of a genre of all time mm -hmm. um, especially for a generation it's yes. ridiculous it, it's still oh, you'd be you amazed bet. new new it's, people it's, it i find that with the suspects it generates mm -hmm. a new audience by the time you're a sophomore in college you owe me five dollars it took him 45 minutes <laughs> <laughs> Right. Right. I can't believe you would take that bet. <laughs> I took the under. I don't know why I took the under. Because exactly. you've been there 164 it. times. That's why. Sorry. No, no. But, but you don't. You don't ever imagine something generates a new audience the way that Swingers does. You think yeah. that it spoke to yeah. its, its its peers. I think it's true, and I think like I think like Suspects, it was something that came out of a moment in one of those those cracks of opportunity in the transition as the, as the business, there's always moments where people get to do what they want and they're operating brief. outside the system. Yeah. And that was kind of the moment when the indies were making money, not all of them, 
but they roll the dice on 10, and if one of them made 100 million, right. and they all cost 10 or less, you could, that's good business. And the, and the studios are starting to acquire those companies, and, and even the studio indie companies right. were getting great deals on talent and low budget productions by calling it an independent film. And so there was a little bit of a creative gold rush going on there right. where people like Brian or uh, Doug or um, Ed, Ed from Brothers McMullen and, and of course Soderbergh kind of kicked it all off oh, yeah. with, um, with Sex, Lies and Videotapes. Uh, and, and then the relevance of Sundance because of, uh, of some of those movies, it, there was a, a, you could sneak one by. Yeah. You could sneak one by. And there were a lot of bad ones then. And, right. and, and I've been in a few. Right. You know, uh, as an actor, but it's it's uh, but there were there was an opportunity to do something you'd never see if it came through the Play-Doh Fun Factory of no, Hollywood. Of course, but it had to have been the heart and humanity of Swingers, not the quotable lines, and not the uber charming, and not just the heartbreak of your so. character. I think it was the story. Yeah, there was a heart and humanity and a sincerity. To what, yeah, yeah, because if you just look at the framework of the house, yeah. it's. Uh, st struggling people in Los Angeles. How can that be relatable yeah, no, to the rest of the world? Not at all. Camp. It was terrible, and that, uh, it was. We were asked to change those things, and that was one of those things where it just came out, right. where I didn't outline, and it came out in like a week, week right. and a half. Right. And what's nice is I've had recently the same experience for the first time since then, or made, of writing something with no outline, and I didn't realize how scared I was of it, and so now I have something and. Wow. And life's different now. It's easier. Sure. But you have to say no to other big things where guaranteed big box office returns, great actors you could work with, uh, nice salary. Mm. But at the end of the day, you got to... Yeah, where are use. you with that mega table that you were able to sit at? Because, you know, one of the things I notice about all the giant movie stars I've worked yeah. with over the years no matter where, how high up the mountain you climb, they're still looking over their shoulder at the next guy. Yeah, I don't know if it's if it's that for me. I'm, I, I'm not competitive. Maybe that's different from being a director. Oh, it absolutely is. Because they, they're, there's, it's a very, or even with actors, I don't know. I, I find that people at a certain point, their struggle is no longer with who's coming. It's not the gunfighter syndrome, it's more like Am I doing what I should be doing now? Yeah. Is my, am I living my life in a way where I'm being a slave to a pattern, right. or a slave to uh, an insecurity, or am I making? Am I being just as brave as I was when I defined myself? Right. Because it's so easy to, to, to. You know the 300 count thread, Egyptian cotton sheets. You get a comfortable life. Yeah. You, you get a family. You get a, an income and. And it's and you have to force yourself to take to take chances and do other things. And sometimes those chances are the big movies because you've never you've never played this kind of game. Yeah. But you, I think you got to kind of step out of your comfort zone and see what that voice in your head that got you here is telling you to do is whispering to you, and turn down opportunities that might not seem to the rational part of your brain like the smart thing to do. Right. But but you have to follow your. That the muse, you have to follow that voice. At you least you have sometimes. to challenge yourself and 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 re maintain a little bit of insecurity. Yeah. About what what you're gonna do. Yeah, and know you're gonna do the safe get route. Knocked around. Yeah. You're gonna get screwed. I want to invite in um, our audience here who who have some questions for you. Um, is, uh, how how is the new YouTube chat room? Is it going well? Experience is it horrible? There's a cringe over there. Yeah, I see. What's it's wrong? Cringy. It's not what we're used to. It's not. What, nobody likes change. No. Yes, we fear change. What happened? Well, we had we have a group of regulars that gather for the last 164 shows, and the thing with YouTube is it's opened up to the comment section. I think they were saying. In yeah, there. that's it. Like this, whatever you type in here lives on forever on YouTube in the comment section. Well, that's exciting. That's great. That that makes for that makes for nice open. <laughs> Discourse. This is so <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm hesitant to. All right. Well, these, to these we ha we have something on the show you may have noticed from uh, the the wealth of episodes you've enjoyed yourself. Uh, we asked the audience to put together questions for uh, the guest uh, in in mm -hmm. a this or that Coke or Pepsi no correct answer oh, kind boy. of thing. Five questions at a time. Nothing, nothing like a uh, nice free association after that preamble. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. And we call them a tweet five. Look who's tweet here five. for you. Tweet hey, five. Hey, Dick Kettner. 
He was at the Second City when you oh, were there. He was. He was. He was an upperclassman when I came in. Yeah. At Improv Olympic, he was studying with Del Close. A funny, funny, funny man, Dave Kickner. Yeah. Just. And killing it in movies now too. Yeah. Uh, you, you you can't stop that energy, that force. No. It's just a smart matter of time guy too. Before someone puts him in the right thing, and then it explodes. He's kind of done level. it, and you know, it's also like I want to hear what he what his idea is. You know, that's what's happening now too. With yeah. thanks to narrow casting and budgets of all sorts, you could you could you could play in all the different uh, 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 ball ballparks. You know, you could you could play in the minors sometimes if you yeah. want to try something, play a different position or. You know, he's in the big ones, too, yeah. doing what he does well. He's so. just unstoppable. Yeah, no, he's, uh, my money's on that guy. All right, so this Tweet 5 comes to you from the Twitterverse. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you enjoying your experience on the Twitter, by the way? Well, is that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay, good. Okay, good. I'm doing good that so far. That was not a question yet. Okay, so uh, This one six. comes from uh, at Adrian Selman. Ready? Yes. Happy Hogan or Tony Stark? Uh, with no context? It's Tony Stark. Director or producer? Director. Comics or movies? Movies. Comedy or action? Comedy. Mandarin or whiplash? Mandarin. See, these are designed specifically for yeah, you. Yeah, no, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. You got uh, five out of five. I got five right? <laughs> Good. When do I win? I have no idea. And I have no, no, no correct The box answer. set of Freaks and Geeks? Yeah. <laughs> Can we plug that? <laughs> I have so many of those in my trunk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Give me a At a reduced rate, by the way. Um, Is there a commentary... Uh, track on, on that? Is, is there a comment? There are, I think, 31 commentary tracks not for 18 on, not episodes. Not on Netflix, so it's, it might be worth me buying. It it's might be good worth for the it. library. It's worth it. All right, I'll take a look at that. Thank you. You're very welcome. I get none of that, by the way. Zero dollars in my pocket. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, at least you're in it for the right reasons. You gotta be. Yeah. Uh, so it was <clears throat> Toronto. You were uh, starring in the Rocky, Rocky Marciano. Marciano. You were... Um, the training, I just remember the stuff that you had to oh, go through yeah, for that. It was, uh, yes. I I'm still recovering. Why, you know, <laughs> I mean... I'm getting ready for the sequel, his older years. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll bundle them and maybe I'll win an Oscar. There you go. De Niro did it in a few months. It took right. me 10 years. Unbelievable. But I'm ready to play old Mar Marciano now. What, what was that like? I mean, because it was not just... A, uh, um... It was hard, man. It was, you know, nobody... It, it, was, it ended up... We thought it was going to be theatrical. It ended up being uh, on Showtime before right. Showtime was Showtime. Oh, yeah. You know? Uh, but it was great to be able to train and do all those things. And I, honestly, my best experiences on it were the camaraderie not just with our movie, but Toronto was Hollywood North. Yeah. And we were all staying at the same hotel. We would have drinks, and that's where uh, uh, dinner... I always felt like we, whenever all of us... Because it was, I think, Janine Garofalo was there. You were doing Abby Hoffman, we right? We were doing the Abby Hoffman with Vincent D'Onofrio and Janine and me and a few other... Uh... And then we had some people from Mars. We had Penelope, and yes. we had... And so we would get the big table or meet, go out to... Was it Fira Mosca? What was the name of the Italian yeah. place across right. the way? And, and I think... Um, Yoso's or fish joint. There was a yeah, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the uh, uh, the guy Montaigne. I think was yes. wasn't he around too? Yes. So it was this great. And I remember sitting and just sharing war stories because everybody felt like they knew each other even when they didn't because you had mutual friends. You all knew each other's work. Right. And I remember everybody else in the restaurant would be looking at our table and like wishing. I was so proud that I got to be at that table. Everybody else wanted to be at to and hear so these stories. And so, dinner for five was hatched from that. That was that was one of the defining moments of like, so I wish somebody could be. I, uh, how are you a fly on the wall in this conversation? Yeah. How do you show this feeling that Algonquin round table, maybe not the same intellects as the Algonquin, but definitely the same humanized More view relatable, of everybody. Certainly. And so I remember just hearing stories from both the movie that we were all on and then movies that we had been on and Penelope had all her stories about Brando from The Freshman and, yeah. and then we were just and we were working with George C. Scott one of his last performances oh, so right. he would Jesus. he would start talking about doing the Willie Loman monologue or me asking him why he didn't accept his Oscar and just being able to just you know sitting in the folding chairs being like so yeah. you know what and what a passionate great talented giving where should Dude. people go to, to catch up on the Dinner for Fives now? They got. Uh, they live obviously. They live. Uh, there's a there's a very good uploaded pirated version on YouTube right now. 
Uh, <laughs> IFC doesn't have it in a but catalog. But it's it's, it's it, uh, no no it's on it's on um, you know it, it's it's out they're out there. Right. We haven't pulled them down. It's good to have people seeing them. Do you remember? You buy selected uh, seasons and, and episodes on. It's Amazon. hard to it's hard to get. It, can you yeah. use whatever? We never really got pulled that together. But I, I'm happy that people are watching it. That was in the hands of IFC though. That wasn't something that you. It was something to... that uh, you know we had. It it. it Maybe someday soon it'll it'll be available, but it, you could look online and find. I uh, think it was good, extraordinary, good though. I mean, it certainly um, it was a preamble to the whole podcast. It was. Culture. There was a bridge. Well, here's where I think it started for, for our youth. And thank you, by the way, for being part of it in the beginning and, and was, returning time and time again. Other than wanting to kill Rod Steiger, it was one of the greatest. Uh, do you remember that at all? Oh, I do. That was our <laughs> second, third episode, maybe. Was it, really? it was you, Sarah Silverman, Rod Steiger. Great, great mix. Every time I went to tell a story, he would stir his ice tea. I don't know that he knew. Do you think he was doing it on purpose? On the fourth time. <laughs> I'm not a paranoid person. So on the yeah. fourth time, I went, this, for whatever reason, this brilliant, brilliant man doesn't care for me. Doesn't want you to land the joke. <laughs> but how great to hear the story about him with Brando in the, the, uh, yeah. the speech in, uh, could have been a contender speech, yeah. with him uh, having the, his perspective on it yeah. uh, without the rose-tinted glasses of, of, uh, you know, of, right. of, of nostalgia. Well, I was going to say, in our youth, uh, the only time you saw actors speak as themselves yeah. Was the early days of the Tonight Show That's with right. Johnny? That was you actually we when you saw Burt Reynolds sitting there with yeah. Johnny, you got a sense of who he was as a person. And I think yeah, with cigarettes and drinks and and there was no sense of no. don't change the channel. Right, right. And I think that's when it changed. And between that those days and and serving jury duty these days, which is when a friend asks you to be on his podcast, that's the new, oh, is it? new version of Jury Duty. I like this. I enjoy this. <laughs> well, because... Well, no, I'd rather this than being interviewed, like, what jokes are you going to tell? Right. For you, you 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 could bring it. With me, I'm never funny. If I'm funny, it's by accident or with something that comes up in the moment. Is there anything more enjoyable, though, than auditioning your anecdotes on the phone with the segment producer the night before doing Letterman or it's, one of them? I'm not good at it. So what else is going on in your life? And then you tell them a story, and then there's a little silence. I just feel like I'm not doing good enough. I, I always feel like I'm, I'm bombing. <laughs> It's uh, horrible. And I come loaded with voices and shit. I, don't know, you're I, I have a bag they of tricks. Even, they don't even ask you anymore. What well, you're no, but say, still, right? it's. No, there's a pretty. Yeah, you do Ferguson? Ferguson, yeah. Ferguson I, I like that because yes. of. Um, yes. He's like, yeah, they'll just, we'll just talk and something will happen. And, he rips up the thing and he and doesn't. And it doesn't, yeah. you know, it, and not every segment that I've been on has rocked, but it's, it, I think it's, it's definitely been a very fun experience. Yeah. And I know Kimmel and I know, yeah. you know what I mean? With me, Letterman still. Intimidating because he's still the guy that I, you know, I I remember Johnny, but Letterman was the guy. And well, he's the closest was. thing to it in terms of yeah. uh, intellect and and and, yeah. and emotional retardation, the whole the whole business, you know. And Jay, I have a very easy time with too. So I, I you know, it's just. But there's a sense of a big stage with those shows. There are. Craig's is very intimate. I think yeah. that's why he's uh, thriving and having so much fun with it. Yeah. Um, but but I like the podcast. This but, is this is fun for me. I, I enjoy this because there's. You could really get at the truth, and it doesn't feel like if you don't soundbite it, you're, it's going to be lost. Right. We could get to the point. Yeah. And I had that experience on Charlie Rose as well, which is I another would, thing that I yeah. sort of because Charlie Rose, you remember, it's all it, well. This half is Charlie Rose. Right. This half is I'm, I'm not sure what this is. This is Wayne's World. Uh, but <laughs> but with Charlie Rose. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. There's a soundbite. There's a sound bite. We'll get to it. Yeah. Okay, can you say that tomorrow on the show? No, I can't. I can't. But with Charlie, there, uh, there's yes. robotic cameras. Yes, and so with Dinner for Five. The... So with Dinner for Five is always like, and it lulls you into this relaxed. Uh, yeah. uh, so with Dinner for Five, we always had long lenses. Oh, I remember. We, we never remember. yelled cut action. We'd roll into it. Yeah. And always would cut out uh, if somebody said something that they felt that they shouldn't have. Right. We always wanted the. Yeah, there was that freedom. I remember very well. Just like here. Yeah, of course, anything you want taken out. That's why we have we'll go this, back in time. the disclaimer. Um, yeah, no, there was a sense of, I remember coming up to you and saying, yeah, you know that thing I said about uh, maybe you don't keep that. Yeah, in there. and yeah. we always pulled it. Yeah. Because you always got to a more relaxed atmosphere, and there's some great but stories. But you said you were thinking about, even then, there was an opportunity, uh, late 90s, to possibly stream live. That was my initial vision for it. Yeah. It was essentially this, right. except with a dinner being served. And it just wasn't there yet. And then I then I had done Ted Demi show on IFC, mm. 
and I remember it was very relaxed. Right. And again, whenever you're not shooting for the whole audience, but narrow casting to a specific audience that could really connect with what you're doing, right. and I think podcasting is the what it is. ultimate version of that, yeah. uh, you are not, you could make it the guests that you know would be the best guests for your conversation and not trying to compete for viewers. Right. And, and IFC was able to, it, for them, we did it as a one-off, right. and then they got such good response that they asked us to do more and more, and we ended up doing 50 of them. Yeah. Uh, but it was a very great learning experience. I don't know if you've had this experience, but it feels like I experienced more of my life on that show than when the cameras were off. That, that was my social life. <laughs> and it was a great excuse to call people up and say, let's go out. And yeah. not a lot of people do that. Right. Falk did it. Yeah. Peter Falk used to do it. Yeah. Go to uh, Guido's or whatever it was called on, on uh on the west side and you'd have like 10 people sitting around give me, or Norby. Give me some of your experience if you don't mind of the uh, when you guys did the movie Made because yeah. you 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 got in that hip pocket because I, I've talked to Alan Arkin about it yeah. of course yeah and um, Ed Begley Jr. also who stayed very close to him all the way to yeah. the end yeah um, you know he he was such an original and such a unique yeah. uh, personality and yeah. talent but uh, crazy smart and ridiculously creative. Uh, so I'm just curious, as you're trying to um, have him flourish the way that later Will yeah. and RDJ yeah. would. Well, that's a different style of it. You that's like, um, that's like, oh my God, I can't believe I could work with this guy. Wait till you see what this guy could do. And that's like, I would put him in that category, Peter Falk, Bob Newhart mm -hmm. on Elf. It's like, that wasn't a surprise to anybody except no. the people who had never seen him before. And right. it's just, and then the people who know that body of work, they bring their history. We don't, we don't differentiate. It's not like we walk into a movie theater and forget everything we know about those people. That's the, that's the, the blessing and the bane of our existence is that you're bringing baggage in with right. you. And it could work to your advantage, like with Robert, where he was bringing a backstory to the role of Tony Stark, you know? Or Vince, where he was bringing the experience of he's an unknown actor popping into this movie, and you're watching him turn into somebody it's what before I was your very eyes. About Burt Reynolds seeing him on the Tonight Show and so uncomfortable yes. with Johnny. That's one of the right. reasons I think he maintained star status for ten straight years. Sure, and, and his movies reflected that with the outtakes and him and Dom DeLuise, who yes. lucky enough to get to know him through the show, as well, right. uh, or Ocean's Eleven. Right. I mean, I was very surprised that they were going to remake that because I was like, how much of it was just watching the summit? You knew they only did two takes of it. Well, you had Soderbergh and great actors, and they did a great job with it. But at the time, it was not an obvious thing because so much of what I thought the charm of that thing was was not the storytelling, but was you were getting to see, look behind the curtain of the fantasy of what these guys are doing when they're right. running around Vegas and right. figuring out what happened right after rap. Yeah, And that yeah. was part of the fantasy, right? Uh, but, but Peter Falk was one of those where you're inheriting some of that you know, here we like to improvise, and he comes from that Cassavetes tradition. And also, everybody thinks of him as Columbo, but the people who know realize that he was really... Murder Incorporated. Yeah. So he was, to show that other side of him, and to be able to craft a role where he could just kill it, and did. And just so much, so much fun. And what a, you know, there are people you encounter, you start to realize that in, in our line of work, there are these people who just have this magical... Mm thing and they work on their skill and their craft and they work hard and they could either honor that or diminish it but they are they they it's like money ball they've got a great swing they yeah. can get on base yeah. and there are certain people when you see them as a as a society as a culture as a human species we recognize that and he was one of those people George C. Scott, I worked with, had it. Chris Farley had it. And there are people who have it in degrees, too. But there are certain people where they just feel like these monoliths as people where there is an energy radiating from them. And if it's harnessed properly, they put out a lot of wattage and make you want to watch them. And compelling. that's, I guess, what I'm learning. Yeah, compelling. What I'm learning as I get older is that, because as an actor, when you start out, you think, if I could just learn how to audition properly or get the right headshot, right. I'll have that thing. But as you're on the other side of the audition, you realize that you're looking for that a quality. Yeah. And sometimes you could learn it, and sometimes you could free it up in yourself. Clark Gable did. He changed in his early years, and that's what the studio system afforded. They helped the, in this Pygmalion, My Fair Lady type of uh, refining, yeah. uh, almost like you would with ore. Yeah. They would change people into 
stars because they'd see that. I think they do it today, and Jason Statham is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at him um, in Guy Ritchie's movies, mm -hmm. and he's not a, a leading man action mm -hmm. hero. And the studio system, they tried it with Ving Ram, uh, 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 um, not Ving Rams, the uh, Vin Diesel. They tried to make him the next Bruce Willis, and now they've succeeded with Statham. I think that they're still trying to mind that. There is, yeah, it's not, it's not as systematic as right. it was back then when it was a factory. Yeah. Uh, where they would give you elocution lessons and teach you how to eat with the right fork and walk around the book on your head or whatever the hell they did that. Yeah. Uh, but there is a version of it as you get. But it's more through attrition, too. And, and the business is changing so much now, too, okay. that it's... Uh, and what's encouraging is that pe there are people who want... The, they want to, to um, consume stories and content, and then, but the old models just don't work as well. And, and just a matter of finding the right the right model for how to deliver content that's specific enough to the audience out there. And I think this is, you know, it, it takes the, the, the pilot experiments like this type of thing. I mean, this isn't something, I've heard you speak about it many times, you didn't th see this as the main thrust of your career when you started off, but it's become this all-consuming, almost obsessive endeavor for you as you're trying to refine the best version of this. And as a viewer or a listener, it's something where if there's somebody on your show, I know that I'm going to get everything I want from your specific perspective, which right. is going to be different than the nerdist perspective. Right. It's a different generation right. hearing them speak to uh, somebody of like Mel Brooks's generation. Yeah. Um, and then I know your frame of reference is going to be mine. And so it, I know you're going to be my surrogate pulling that information and making them comfortable to speak in a way that they wouldn't maybe on a talk show, and certainly not within the commercial breaks. So you could seek out exactly what you want of the thousands of hours of content out there online, and you could find that moment that speaks right to what your curiosity is. And so you learn and you're engaged in a way that you haven't been able to before. And I think the hours you spend in front of your TV, clicking TiVo or Netflix or, or Apple TV, or, or digging through podcasts, you're getting a concentrate of exactly what you're curious about. Yeah. And you could click off of it if it's not the thing you thought it would be. And so it's a, it's a wonderful time for having your curiosities quenched, and I see it in my children. Well, I was going to say, given all those opportunities and given that new menu, yeah. how does your 11-year-old son sit still for the sting? It, that's a hard one. Yeah. You know, it is. And he, you know, an, an hour and a half in to the two-hour and ten-minute movie, he's like, how much longer? And I'm like, hang with it. Just watch what's happening. I'm explaining to him what a wire, you know, what you know, what a gambling house with a wire is, with the horse racing and, and the how poker works, and why and who that guy's a Fed and that guy's a, a bunco cop from Chicago, and and so you know, sort of quietly whispering as not to disturb the full house, by the way, sure, uh, for the show, and saying just watch, it's going to pay off soon. Hang with it, trust me. And by the end, he's like, that was the greatest. Yeah. But how much of that is it's the greatest because that I was sitting with him? A certain amount. Like I saw it with my dad when it came out in 73, right. and I was his age. So some, so much of it is you're going to have that moment with your kid where they're going to remember that you were together, and that's what's going to make it charged and magical and give it a valence. So choose what you direct them to because they're going to go back to that thing when you're gone. Yeah. And they're going to say, Dad thought Mel Brooks was, my dad laughed at Woody Allen. Let me learn about Woody Allen or this music or that. Yeah. And they'll rebel against it, but they'll come back to it. And yeah. that goes for religion, that goes for storytelling, television shows, music, anything. And so as it being a dad, that's the fun part of it is that you realize that. Because I have such vivid memories of episodes that were only two hours long. and Because I, I think of Blazing Sounds like I'd seen it 50 times, but I know I couldn't have because yeah. there was no video. No. I watched it once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> Or Animal House, I saw four times or five times, and I know, you know, yeah. it's not like an album, it's not like The Stranger, Billy Joel, I know it because I listened to it over <laughs> and over again. I only saw that movie a couple times, That's but right. it, 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 but you're so impressionable, right. and it feels like, with, with the internet, it feels like my kid is like in the little Superman capsule, just getting programmed, yeah. and so you hope the right stuff's getting in, you try to encourage the right stuff getting in. But these kids, this is like a super generation that's coming up next that's uh, native to all of this information. And, uh, and they chase what they're curious about. And they can learn much more than we could have watching The Love Boat and, uh, and Manimal or yeah. whatever the hell we were. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm seeing. slightly older, so it was uh, Wild Wild West, 
Uh, Artemis Gordon, one of the all-time great inspiring character yeah, actors. Just, how many people clicked off? Do we have? Do we get numbers from YouTube? Um, we, uh, you know, we're up for the same job. What? You got it. I, I auditioned in Chicago for the um, Rob Reiner uh, silent, silent. Oh, 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 Morton and Hayes. Morton and Hayes. Ed, that net yes. went wide, my friend. Yes. We were part of a 3,000. We offered it to Penn and Teller initially. Really? And uh, they said no. And then they said, all right, we have to build a comedy team yes. from the 30s. Yes. Oh, and man. Rob was like a, almost like in Spinal Tap, like a personality that was inviting oh, yeah. you in, right? Yeah. I remember I got like called back in Chicago early enough in my career when I thought, I'm close, you know. The guy I did the pilot like, with, yeah. Joe Gozzola, was a Chicago yeah. actor at the time. Listeners, thank you for supporting our show here. That'd be Kevin Pollock's chat show. I love being able to deliver this podcast to you for free, and I would like to keep doing it. Now there's a simple way for you to help. In order to serve you better, I'd like some honest input. Please, please, please take a few moments to fill out our easy survey at themidroll.com slash survey slash Pollock. Let me say it again correctly once. The Midroll, that's the, T-H-E, mid, M-I-D, roll, R-O-L-L, aha, themidroll.com slash survey slash Pollock. Pollock, also I should mention, spelled P-O-L-L-A-K, not the way most people spell it, especially those who sent us congratulatory emails. You'll be asked about your podcast listening preferences and opinions about advertisements in shows. The answers you provide will make a big difference. You can help make it easier for me to keep financing this program while maintaining my integrity and creative freedom. You heard me. The short survey at themidroll.com slash survey slash Pollock won't take much of your time, unlike this particular read. But it'll go a long way in supporting the cause. So head on over to, yep, I'm going to say it again, themidroll.com slash survey slash Pollock to weigh in when you're done. Wow, which we're not, by the way. When you're done, you'll get to see responses from your fellow podcast fans from around the world. Thank you for participating. I, I, I have a sense that what's happening on YouTube or, or on Earwolf with people listening and watching after the fact is that they're wondering why are we not playing Who Tweeted? It seems like a perfect opportunity <laughs> is that to it? break that, things up. How does this game work? This game, Sammy Levine is going to host oh. and explain to you the rules. More water, is sir. Is it a good time for Your the water? For the, uh... Roll the yeah. thing. Roll the intro. Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game we're gonna play. Oh, welcome back. This is a very exciting edition of Who Tweeted. Sammy, I'm just drawing off my computer. Will you please explain to our lovely guests how the game works? With pleasure. Thank but first, you. a question, because you just happened to mention religion. I heard a rumor that you were what I like to refer to as a secret Jew. What Any truth? Not anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Blowing your cover. I understand. You is have that, you're that, hiding Jews in the floorboards. <laughs> is, that, is that how the game works? <laughs> he wins. You win the game. Shit. It's just like a 20 bucks. I, when I win. Uh, all right. Well, rumor confirmed. <laughs> Fabulous. I win the bet. Okay. So this is how we play Who Tweeted. Yeah, thank you, Sam. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a series of eight tweets. One at a time. Now, each tweet was either written by Tyra... Oh, jeez. Paris uh -huh. or Bieber. Yeah. This is the fun part. You're going to love it. And they're all real. And these are oh, all these are absolutely real tweets. Um, so, uh, and they're not chosen by Jamie as an obvious. Uh, no, none of these the are. The only editing is I take out obvious things, like if, like, like if they use one of their catchphrases. Like if Tyra would. I, I wouldn't even know yeah. what the yeah, we, that's right. the only thing. <laughs> but I'm glad you do. But like, we, like, a ty like if it said like fierce, like that's one of her things. Like right. Tyrus thing. Is that Tyrus thing? Yeah. Tyrus says fierce a lot. But the audience would. The audience yeah. is getting like a. She says smiles a lot. Yeah. Smile with your eyes. We like to break it up with the silly. So bear with. Sure. No. It. All right. Cool. Silly's okay. Uh, right. So here's how it works. I'll start reading a tweet, and then as soon as you feel like you know who authored it. You ring in by saying your own name. You this is like, this is gonna be like having Tommy Lee Jones on TRL. You realize that. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to be. You got the wrong. TRL. You got the wrong, you got the wrong guy. That's not even a That's current reference even. anymore. That's how old I am now. That's all right. You really can't do much worse than Kevin. He doesn't know where he is. <laughs> so. This is great. This is what. There's job security. Do you think Al Gore had this in mind when he invented the internet? Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. I do, actually. 
Uh, you say your own name, then I will point you. You'll have three seconds to say either Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. I have to say my own name, too? Yes. When Just you ring in. So when you, you ring in. Like a In other words, we right. both okay. said buzz at the same time. We have to wait till the end of the tweet. As soon as you feel like you know. Okay. And how much more time do we have left? Uh, on the podcast? On the podcast, we have like... Or we just going to keep coming up with shit to do? We're just going to keep coming up. <laughs> okay, You're good. not leaving. I'm ready. I'm ready. You're not leaving. Okay. Okay. Are you ready to play? Yes. Great, because the winner of this game... We're barely at the one hour mark, by the way. Okay, good. Gets that $20 bill. There it is. We're playing for something? The Dancing four. Andrew Jackson? For $20, that's right. And All what's right. the Dan score? Okay, I'll just... Here's I'll how the scoring works. You ring and you get it right, you get five points. You ring and you get it wrong, you lose three. Once oh. someone rings in, they either get it right or wrong, then we move on. Yes, exactly. All right, here we go. Tweet number one. Shake it up tonight on Disney Channel. Yeah, that me in the middle. Uh, John. Bieber. Oh, I'm sorry. Tyra. Tyra. Three. Tyra. It's okay. That's all right. This is a very easy game. Scores swing wildly. Tweet number two. It's only the first one. I'm sure That's all right. Okay. It's going to be fine. I got to get my uh, legs Tweet. under me here. Tweet number two. Okay. I see you all. Trust me. Kevin Bieber. That is correct. No. You are. No idea. You're like Rain Man. <laughs> <laughs> I only did it because if the first one wasn't, then I had a 50-50. The next true. one would be. Yeah, that's okay. what you Good. think. Good. That's what I think. See? Tweet number three. Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger. Can I take your order? Kevin Tyra. Whoa, I never, ever so would get two in a row. Is, this is like sparring with <laughs> what? Tyson. Why? Is... Why would I invite a guest to play a game What's and then the with you? dominate? What the hell's the matter with you? Tweet number four. Uh-huh. Laughter is timeless. Imagination has no age. What? And dreams are forever. John Paris. He's back in the game! Oh, that is correct. Negative. Now I now I can bet on the Daily Double. <laughs> <laughs> now you do not owe Alex Trebek Plus money two. when you leave. That's right. <laughs> Tweet number five. Get Meanwhile, excited can you now. believe Paris wrote, tweeted that last thing, by the way? Oh, now I can. <laughs> <laughs> five points worth. <laughs> All right. Poetry. Tweet. Oh, man. Tweet number five. It's getting exciting. Worst birthday. What? That's it? Yeah. That's all you get. Probably has a f photo with it. Kevin Paris. Ooh. Ooh. What? Sorry, no. The Beebs. I can't believe he didn't get that. That's all they talked about o on O&A this week. Yeah, I missed O&A all week. Uh, the Beebs. What, what's O&A? Just like to point out, you are Obi one correct Obi answer Anthony. away from a tie game. Heading in to tweet number six. It's like judo. I'm using his momentum <laughs> against him. <laughs> That's right. Tweet number six. It's directed at Downton Abbey. I watched your finale last night. Insomnia after. I'm a hot mess of emotion right now. John Tyra. It's a tie game, ladies and gentlemen. Interesting. Tie are you, game. Are you into Downton Abbey? Love it. Love it, too. Yeah. Ooh. Well, we, yeah. Well, we'll see Let's go. Well. Are we ready? Do you have another <laughs> podcast about that? Do you have... Do you have, do you have uh, chatting on the Abbey or something like that? Yeah. Upstairs, downstairs, the Downtown Abbey I think podcast? we just started it. Uh, yes, yeah. we could do that. Sammy, wrap this up. We've got another podcast to do. I, all right, here we go. Come Tweet on. number seven. It's anyone's game. It really is. Bro brought to, to you go. by Freaks and Geeks. Now on, you, now on DVD. Now on Netflix and streaming. Netflix streaming. <laughs> Only Tweet. two left. Tweet number seven. At home watching Anger Management. Love this show. Kevin At Paris. Uh oh! Wow! Now it's yours. That's impressive. Now, so it's not Jeopardy rules. You could just come in. You knew was it anger management? I'm just guessing, totally guessing. It's good. Right. This is the eighth. I'm totally okay. guessing. Potentially I final tweet. I mean, little deduction. Bieber's not watching anger management. Now, should you ring in and get this correct, we'd have a, a tie. A tie. If not, twenty dollars is back in the kitty. Goes back. Back, <laughs> goes back to the house. <laughs> Maybe Barry Sonnenfeld can win twenty. Tweet number eight. Yeah. Who's better at this, me or Arkin? Honest. You're crushing it. Okay. I don't think you got one right. <laughs> he sat through this? Out, <laughs> Arkin? <laughs> <laughs> and this is why we play the game! People, okay. these are the jokes! Tweet number eight. No, yeah. he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> you guys ready for tweet number eight? Yeah, yeah. We're on the edge of our seat. I'm ready. Are you kidding? It's all the marbles. <laughs> Hi. Oh, you're a son of a bitch. Why? <laughs> How is that the I gotta go for the win. John? I tweet now the butt think 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 think. Uh, I'll go Paris. Oh! oh. It was.
was Tyra. It was Bieber. I, Bieber, I would have. No, I would have never got that. It was the Biebs. I was going to lay That's off. That's a confident tweet. Uh, yeah. But you know what? I should have known it from the birthday one. Because he's a guy, he's more, he's more of a haikuist. Yes. Because <laughs> there's not Less a lot words. to say yet? No, yeah. just well-chosen words. I see. Thank you, Sammy. My nice absolute kid. pleasure. It was delightful All right, good. playing Put with both of you. Put this back in the kitty. All right, there I guess we this go. goes back to, the, back to next week. We'll see how it's Does yeah, it yeah. roll over like, sure. like free parking? Like, a, like <laughs> is it 40? It's 40 next show. Next it, show is 40. Um, is it 40? Celebrities have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game that we just played. Um, yeah, he's directing that. You probably heard me say that. Beverly Hills Cop. The show you're in. Um, this question comes to you, uh, John, from at Russell underscore Hannah. What was your favorite scene to direct when filming Elf? Wow. I can't imagine there's a favorite, but if you can think of... Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good... Something... Well, I know it wasn't the one I was in. That's, that's always hard. Um, I like... Me, uh, we went on the street with a van and a camera and some sticks... And we ran around the city with Will in an elf costume and worked some of those bits out when he first arrives in New York. That's when we had enough confidence built up that we were ready to just go out there and Will did, like when he's getting his shoes shined, he's laughing his ass off, or he's trying to hail a cab, or he's, he would just find stuff to do. And to me, uh, and some of it was scripted and some of it we just found, and we just would plop down and do it. And I remember I was in New York, and I said, I wanted a shot with him walking, long lens, with him walking down, because he's a little taller than everybody with his hat, and the crowd of people on, in midtown Manhattan, heads bobbing, and just long lens, and you see him, like in Tootsie. You know, remember Tootsie, yes. he's walking down the street, so I said, I want a shot like Tootsie. And the way it was, it was lined up like this, and, said, and the dude running the camera said, I know, I shot that shot. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> Why don't you just do, show me what you're thinking, and I'll let you know if I like it. Holy and, uh, shit. Yeah, so it was like, and you get to... The and, operator said that? The operator said that he wow. was there. He might have been an AC or sure. something. Uh, but I remember working on Made. We did a steady cam yeah. shot. It was Larry McConkey who had done the Copacabana shot with um, Scorsese. Scorsese on steady cam. So it's like when you're in New York, there's a small yeah, community of right. people who work. And now the film business in New York is just exploding. Yeah. And I, well, we never really got to. I finally worked with Marty on yeah, Wolf of yeah, Wall yeah. Street. I want to get to that, actually. Yes. And uh, now we're, we have something else Sounds to do. Great. We have to, I was gonna ask you about have to smell somebody's yourself. dirty laundry and guess who it is? <laughs> yes. Yes. It's same three, by the way. <laughs> I was going to ask you about directing yourself, but yes. let's, let's, uh, let's jump. We can come back to that. Let's jump to the yes. um, uh, Wolves of Wall Street. Wolf, the Wolf of Wall Street, okay. based on uh, Jordan. Jeez, I forget the last name. Uh, Leonardo plays an actual, uh, based on the life story of an actual broker who lived this life of decadence and wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. And it kind of has a similar rhythm to the gangster films that he had done, like a casino or a, or a Goodfellas, Holy where shit. it's told through, except instead of violence, it's all coke and orgies, apparently. Yeah. Fortunately, I play a lawyer. I'm not in those scenes. Uh -huh. But I got to be in the Scorsese movie, walking with Leo doing the monologue to camera type of thing and, right. and, and me, me being, pretending he's not talking to camera and just and then work with Rob Reiner who plays his dad in it and and be on set for one of those big steady camp shots Holy and, crap. and uh, the one that you shoot all day and get it just right and dial it in and right. and it was great because so much of it was I've been hearing especially from you what it's like to work with him and it really struck me what an open happy generous laughing tickled, amused guy that he turned out to be. And just to see how loose he was. I thought he was going to be like a boom, boom. And there were certain things he was. But for the most part, he would laugh at the monitor. He'd say, oh, try saying this. Try doing this. Or what would you do there? Or how would you say this? And it was such a disarming environment. And While being meticulous, I think, about his composition. Yes, probably. The, the freedom within is complete. But, but when they were roughing in the shots, and he was working with a DP he hadn't worked with before. Oh, really? There was a lot of back and forth, and... Oh, this was Bob, Bob Richardson. Yeah. yeah. My go-around, which, yes. you know... Yes, the great Bob Richardson. Holy fuck. Yeah, he's, uh... So he's working with a new guy. Well, that's... Isn't, yeah, and, and so it, it, there was a lot, especially, there were certain shots that were designed. Yeah. They were all designed, but when he would rough it in, it wasn't like he... He wasn't like Hitchcock walking in with, um... 
there were certain things that he sketched out, but there's a lot of things right. where he's just sort of seeing what we did and then lining it up. Uh, and I was only in a handful of scenes, but but my God, that was you know that's bucket list time. Yeah. And I finally got to f uh, be there, and it and it and half of my effort went into performance, and the other half was like, don't forget a minute of what's happening now, because right. as just a director. You want to learn, you know, that's, you get to sneak onto somebody else's set and watch them and learn from them. And so I, I just try to be a sponge. But you had always done that according to the dossier. From the very yes. beginning, you were sort of drawing, even on Rudy. Yeah, especially Rudy. Yeah. Yeah, David Onspa was still still one of the best I've ever worked when with. When you and Vince were stuck in uh, South Bend. South Bend with Per Diem and nothing yes, but time on their hands. That's true. That's true. Um, now, Okay, so directing yourself, here's the thing. I'm allegedly uh, eventually directing this movie that I wrote. Yes. And, and I foolishly put myself into the part. He's sort of the, the, the guy who is the audience listening to the detective tell the story. Yes. And so he asks questions that allows for exposition. But, yes. And I needed an everyman, and I thought, why should I give this to Tony Shalhoub when I'm competing yeah, with him sure. for these parts? But... I, so I went around and talked to actors who directed. Yes. I have not done that with you. Yes. And so I, I, I want to ask you this one thing that, that uh, the wonderful Tom Hanks, who mm -hmm. that thing you do, so yes. beautiful and wonderful. I said, give me the one thing that you fucked up on your first time. That's what I really am curious about, your first time. Now you've done 73 films. But your first time, what was the one thing that you, moment you wish you could have had back? And he said, well... I was working with him, great DP, Tak Fujimoto, sure. and he said, um, the scene is where the guys first come into that big, big theater. Yes. They're going to perform in this big theater for the first time. Yes. And he said, I woke up in the middle of the night at 3 in the morning with this epiphany of how the shot should start. So I got to the set. First thing, I grabbed Tak. I grabbed, pull him into the theater. I go, here's what I want to do. I want to start on that chandelier, that old chandelier that's been there since the 40s. And the guys will come in. We won't hear, see them, but we'll hear them. And they'll come in the bottom of the frame, and we'll just slowly come down. And we'll just as they're reaching the stage, and we won't waste any of that time of them walking in. We'll hear all that. And, uh, and, and so I just see this beautiful move, and, and Tex says, okay, all right. Tell you what, why don't we have the actors come in and run the scene, and then we'll figure out where to put the camera. And Tom goes, you mean like every other? A situation I've ever been in as an actor, where we let the actors do the scene, yes. and then we, 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 you have the thing, we are over on the side, we figure yes. out where yes. to put them. And Tom said, yeah, yeah, I let go of the chandelier epiphany real fast. That's interesting. I was much more interested in what the actors were going to do. Yes. Because it wasn't a shot of, or a scene about a, a chandelier from the 40s. So, it, it, was there a a moment or have any moment that's come across where you talk about the being on the set of Scorsese, some sort of educational moment where you thought, I'm filing this one away, this is a keeper in terms of uh, circumvent this little... I think it's a disposition. Puzzle. I think it's the disposition of finding the, what the scene is about. Yeah. And so much of my job as a director is, is really just dialing in the actors as to what either we just did before Right. or what's in the script and we talked about what that scene was going to probably be like mm -hmm. and what scene is next and giving them a context of where it falls within the arc of the story. Or sometimes conspiratorially saying, listen, this is what happened in this other scene. I know you're only in this scene, but I'm going to need, mm -hmm. I'm going to need you to change the energy here as a rhythm thing. So what I need from you as a storyteller is this. And, and as soon as they understand what the goal is, uh, they may have a difference of opinion but at least there's a conversation going on. And oftentimes I will, I'm not sure about exactly what everything should be. And so if there's a different idea that's strong, I'll do both. Right. And really try to do my best version of both. And then the editing room, look at how it's all gonna fit together. But I'm very rarely the type of director that's like, you come off of this and you come into this. I just feel embarrassed. I just would never, I'm not that kind of, I don't feel like I have that background. But I do know I, I understand what an act, I could look at an actor's eyes and, and, and draw insight from their thoughtfulness. Mm. Or I will have watched Gwyneth and Robert uh, having an argument during a rehearsal and then will have written in the argument that they had, not as the characters, but as the people, and then use it as their characters. Right. And then they hook into it. They know I'm watching and listening and it hooks them into that energy. So I get them to hook into, or with Vince, a bit that he had done at a late night at a diner, working it into the script, and then using that as a hook. 
because I as an actor know I need a hook to get into the right voice, the right to channel the right energy, the right emotion, to get angry, to get sad. And so I try to give those tools and trick the actors into easily doing it as opposed to making them have to do the hard work on their own. So I try to really be a good golf caddy, kind of. Right, right. um, as far as directing yourself, I had done it early on. And I had, it, it's harder to do, in, like with Happy Hogan, in the first Iron Man, I did very little because it was like I had so much on my mind. By the second one, I gave myself a bit to do that I could sort of keep on my own time with me and with Scarlett. But when I'm, but I'm basically background in most of the scenes. In the third one, I get a lot to do because I'm not the director. I get to be just a, a friend of the family and a producer and right. a cheerleader. And, but it also allowed me to have a lot more fun with a very supportive group of people between Shane and Robert and Kevin. So uh, I got to do a different version than I would have done had I been directing because you often feel like I don't want to be selfish. Sure. I keep thinking of Eugene Levy on SCTV when he's directing himself screaming cut in the face of the uh, actress <laughs> in the middle of a love scene. And that's what it feels like to me. Because right. when you're actors, there's an there's a equality. When you're a director, you're watching and you're helping them do their thing. It's a very hard line to cross yeah. where, but it could be done. Because look at Dances mm -hmm. with Wolves. Look at Braveheart. There are people who do their best work as a director. And I want to try to crack that nut, which I don't think I've done. And, and, and that I'm planning on my next project to be something where I'm directing and being in it at the same time. Small, yeah. but something where I could really put the energy into the performance. But generally, in the past, I've been a passive um, foil to Vince in Swingers or to Vince in Maid or, uh, in, or to Robert in Iron Man or in Elf just delivering exposition, as you were saying, right. where you just want to get in, get out. I'd always heard Sidney Pollack said, oh, I hate acting in my own movie in Tootsie. I'm like, he's great in Tootsie. He's amazing. It sounds like he's being humble, but really I could see what it's about. It's just like he got so much to worry about, and now I got to get in, in the trailer, and now I got to, you know, because the, a good character actor is a very selfish performer. Mm. When I hire somebody, I want them to try to steal the scene. Right. And my leading man wants them to do it too, and I'm usually a character. It's a different energy when you're a director because you're very giving and yeah. very accommodating right. and you're, you're hosting the party. You don't want to host the party and then sing karaoke to your guests all night. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And that's kind of what it feels like. That's pretty beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, for my own thing, I already decided that I would, my stuff can be shot literally the last two uh, days yeah. work on yeah. the whole that's good. shoot because it is in, in a, a one set. Um, you well, phone booth too? What are you doing? <laughs> it's in a diner. <laughs> okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, That'll work. Well, yeah. Just you in a diner right there. I'm there. Yeah, you know. I'm in. Who doesn't want to see that? Is it, is it deterrence too? <laughs> it is deterrence too. I uh, know a detective sit, goes into a diner, sits down, and tells a story to a guy sitting there, and then we go into the story. Nice. Yeah. Very citizen king. Come in and out of it, and so on and so forth. Um, Congratulations. Are you happy doing this soon? Uh, allegedly. You know, it's, it's been set up and fallen apart so many times now. And I joke that I don't think you should be able to... Uh, the first time it was set up, literally almost 10 years ago, at Focus, uh, greenlit without notes, mm -hmm. where two weeks into the casting process, the president gets, of the company gets fired, new guy comes in and flushes everything down the toilet. Wow. And I say, you shouldn't be able to join the DGA unless that's happened to you. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I said it last week to Mark Duplass, who said, it hasn't happened to me. Has it happened to you? It just happened. Oh, oh. Jersey Boys. Jersey Boys. Yeah, it always happens. Yeah, right? Happens a lot. Yeah. It's it a version of it. But that's not, that's just, uh, that's just the way that's things not are. why it's happening. That's how it's happening. That's right. There's a bigger why. Yeah. I like to think. I think it's all connected somehow, that there's some big lesson that you're going to understand at the end. Oh, I'm way more mature in every possible way yeah. from 10 years ago. And also spent so much more time now with the material, and, and now Billy Bob Thornton wants to be the detective, and these kind of things, yeah, which wasn't happening 10 it's, years it's ago. That's right, and, I, and I, that, the frustration of that made me sit down and write something which I wouldn't have done uh, had I not. So I think those things... There are certain things, the angels are shepherding you through life and having forcing doors closed to make you take different paths. And I think uh, there is a there is some underlying strategy are to this. Are you finding newfound energy rolling up the sleeves and working yes. on this script? Oh, yeah. Because there's fear and insecurity. It's, it and is good. You know what it was? I heard Lucas talking about, you know, all the Star Wars stuff, which is so exciting. You know, as a, somebody who grew up watching those, I can't wait to see them. And... 
But the thing that nobody talks about is he says, yeah, and I want to, after I sort of say goodbye to this, I want to go make small movies that maybe not everybody wants to see. I'm like, that's, that is the, you know, yeah. You mean that, American that, Graffiti type of small movie. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, and, and you know what, so, so do I. Yeah. Like, and you don't have to decide between them. No. Just, I want to, you know, I see that, and there is, if you're not, if you don't get drunk on the big effects movie, and you want to play at the big train set every time, you can make as small or as, uh, as gentle or offbeat of a film as you like. And, oh, absolutely. And so uh, it, 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 it sort of reoriented me uh, as I heard that, saw other people really finding their voice in small ways, yeah. not just in movies now, as I said, in television, on HBO, FX, all the, there are voices percolating up that are so sincere that and that's what I'm compelled by. That's what I find myself rushing to when it's the, it's on my TiVo queue. I'll jump to girls or I'll jump to uh, Bad, Bluey or Mad yeah. Man, yeah. And, and then the personal stories like that as well. Like yeah. there is a wonderful uh, set of voices that are that are coming up in this new environment. That again, it's not the crazy, huge ratings or syndication or killer box office. But none of that matters. But anymore. it seems to make it seems to be room for that yeah. to sort of these green shoots to come up and develop into a really the best, most personal drama I think for sure is happening on television and has for the oh, last yeah. five or six it's years. It's a golden without, age without comparison. and it's pulling network towards it now because it's you know you have the outliers that are taking the very uh, the, the more ambitious swings and then that's drawing people are starting to understand that an audience is drifting towards that and so it's it's dragging. You know, network television towards it as well, and and movies are movies. You know, the big ones are going to be are just getting safer because they're so big and they have to work. Otherwise, the whole machine breaks down. So, and you have to appeal to everybody because you got to get everybody in the theater that first weekend, all four quadrants. And uh, it's exciting, but it's it's daunting. You know, you're protecting studios, brands. You're you have a lot of responsibility. Uh, and some of it is to yourself, but it's a part of the pie. Right. But you're fitting into a context of uh, an entire brand often. And so it's, uh, there's, it's fun and exciting, but it's, it's also fun to be able to go and just, you know, do a small thing that you want to do that may not make everybody laugh or relate to it. But it's off the beaten path of you what everybody You have that like. opportunity now. Yeah. I you mean, just have to say, I want to do it. That's right. I mean, Soderbergh seems to. Soderbergh is great at it. Yeah. Soderbergh. And by the way, I would argue that Dances with Wolves, Braveheart, those were all, that, that was all, remember that was the whole one for you, one for me time of yeah. filmmaking. Sort of changed a little bit. Those were all the one for me's yes. that won the Oscars and ended up being these profound works. So, right. you know, it's always been sneaking one by uh, because they never want you to, they always want, you know, even, even the brave executives, they, it's going against their DNA of what their job is. Right. They want to deliver safety and security each fiscal quarter. Uh, but there is an opportunity if you could keep your scale small enough to, because of new media, DVD's kind of on its way out, but VOD and, and, uh, and, and, and online streaming, different, you know, there are different content providers, I mean, uh, delivery systems that are looking for content. And so if you could make it work within their parameters, and also the international market's growing so much, especially non-English speaking, that there's a, a, a movie theaters being built you know, in Russia at a staggering rate, China, everywhere. So there are people who want to see this, and there's a way to create a world community of people sharing in this content, both online and, and in theaters, that it is a shrinking, as things are growing culturally, we're all shrinking and informing one another and understanding one another. So it's a, it's a very, very exciting time. And people could be finding up, out about our culture by this. People can seek this out. And if they're curious about you or me or something we're talking about, there could be a, there could be a kid in Thailand looking at this thing and learning about comedy and movie making. Uh, literally saying, why did they play who tweeted? Um, <laughs> The first time, or when you brought Harrison Ford to Comic Con, was that his first time there? Yes. Oh my God, I've got to get a yes. little glimpse yes. of that if I may. That was us sitting around the campfire, literally. Uh, I love that guy, by the way. He's the best, and and um, he's everything you hope he'd be. 
and here he was playing a cowboy and I was sitting around the campfire and we're all getting ready to go to Comic-Con and do a little teaser reel uh, there for Cowboys and Aliens. And I said, so what do you think, man? Comic, just in and out, we're all going, Daniel's going, I'm going, I, they'd be so happy to see you. And he said, if, if I went, the only way i go is in handcuffs. And I, and I said, what if we got handcuffs? Could we get some handcuffs? <laughs> and, he, and he laughed. He's a very funny guy. I don't know if you've had the chance yeah. to talk to him. The best storyteller. I mean, like old school Borscht Belt. Wow. Myron Cohen stories. Wow. Like that kind of storyteller. Wow. He's hilarious. Uh, but loves to tell an engaging long. I mean, it's like going to be like a 10 minute one, but sure. it pays off. Right. Uh, and he, he always likes a good, a good laugh, and so, yeah, that would be, so from the prop guy, we got the handcuffs, we flew out, and he came on stage in the handcuffs, and just, I've never heard no. such a loving reception of 6,000 people, surprised, because it wasn't announced, and just seeing him, and just rewarding him for... All of it. Everything. Yeah. Everything. He was the guy, he's the guy. He, between Indiana Jones and Han Solo, and... And then all the other work, Mosquito Coast, and you know, he's done so much. Now here he's going to be in Anchorman 2, which is like, um, Ooh, yeah. That hasn't hit the wire. Yes, it did. Did it? It's been out there. I, I only know from the wire. I have no inside me. information. It's not like he's calling me, Favreau said you are in Anchorman 2. Uh, but uh, what a great, could you imagine what that's going to be? Gonna be oh my God, that's, that's worth the price of admission. So, yeah. uh, so he's just so having him there, and just being in, being able to being in his, him him flying me from set in his helicopter in the desert, and not being the best flyer anyway, and realizing that he there's I'm in the co-pilot seat. So me gently asking him, so if so if I notice if something might he says if I die you die. Is that what you're asking me? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. And did he have anything to say afterwards? Uh, the Comic-Con thing? Yeah. Did he suggest that it was at, fun at all? He'll never say... Right. He, he'll, he'll, he's dismissive and humble. Right. And, but I saw, I was moved just being next to him, feeling that outpouring. I mean, it was like, you know, How pride could, of the Yankees. You know what I mean? I just could not be palpable. Oh, it was so... I was so proud that I brought him. Sure. Like, look what I got. Well, that's the... Like, that was like, I was so happy that I threw him out there in front of everybody, and it was just, there's energy. There's a real thing that happens, yeah. you know, and that's, it's, it's there. It's, it's, well, you know, from being a performer on stage, most people don't assume that, but there is a, a magic thing that goes on when you're in when you're connected well, with those there, people. In that sense also, there was a sense for everyone present, this is the first time this has ever happened yes. and it may probably be the last. That is, it, it, even if it's in the subconscious, it is part of that instant experience of him walking on the first time with those, in those handcuffs. And yeah. so you're sitting there thinking, or maybe not thinking, maybe not till much afterwards, um, how, 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 you just want to be present, obviously, but you but you've also got to take a little bit of pride in knowing that you forced this yeah, to happen. Yeah, it is. Because look, why do we get into what we do? We want to make people happy. We yeah, want sure. to. We get inflated when other people are enjoying themselves. Right. And I notice it with with chefs. I've been doing some. One of the thing I wrote has set against the backdrop of a culinary world. Right. Wow. Chefs are very much that too. You know, you think it's all about ego and driven, but really the bottom line of what they want is they want to make sure you like their food. Mm. Same thing with, with, with movies. I have a vision. I want to do this, this, this. Do they like it? Yeah. Did they laugh at my joke? Right. Did they like what I did? Like, there's something in us that gets our validation from other people's acceptance. Yeah. And I don't know if that comes from your dad laughing at your joke, or you standing up on the on the coffee table in the living room and doing your impressions, or Bill Cosby or whatever. Uh, why, watching but, my folks laugh uncontrollably at Cosby, that was the first, and that's the, definitely the one that stayed you the most because you'd just never seen your parents act that way before. Right. So I'm sure for me, it's, that was the and, genesis. And so you, it, it gets transposed onto these faces yeah. in the crowd. How do I create that happiness? That's right. Yeah. You're chasing that same buzz. Yeah. And, and I think it's the same thing. And it really comes down to, and this is what Falk talked about with Shandling, actually, on that second episode of Dinner for Five. He says it's about, oh, it's about looking for love. 
we're all looking for love in our own version of it. Mm. And for us, that's the version. For other people, it's being respected, it's winning. I didn't grow up in a, in a, in a household where the, who won the World Series was the people we held up on a pedestal as much as the people that entertained us or the guy who could make the rest of the family shut up long enough to tell a story and get a laugh. Right. That was the pecking order in my tribe. Mm. Each, if I grew up in Texas, it might have been about playing football on Friday nights. Sure. But for me, it was about who could hold the, how young can I be and still hold the attention of all the grownups at, Massive. The, at, the, at the table? Massive. Right? Yeah. So that's my, that's my gladiator school. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So now it, it comes into, I want to make, and so when talk about a moment like that, whether it's, and that's why Comic Con in general is, because it's not me, I'm not doing a tight, 20. No. I don't have that. No, you don't But what it. I do is I could be the, and now I got a, some footage from this movie you didn't expect and check out your first glimpse at Iron Man. Yeah. And the first time people saw that footage at Comic-Con, 6,000 people, that's the moment the movie became successful, even though it didn't come out for another year. And here's the surprise, here's this guy. And always trying to outdo the thing you did and having the entire premiere of Cowboys and Aliens there and inviting everybody at Comic-Con to come. Yeah. You know, that was the fun, you're the DJ of the party. You're the, you're the guy who's going to make sure, you're the MC who's going to make sure everybody's having fun right. and show them that you hear them and you care about them. And, um, and I think that, and, and same thing when you go opening night of a movie and you sneak from theater to theater. That's what Robert and I had done when Iron Man came out. We would sneak from theater to theater and even run up in an, and he was like, we should intro it. So we would run up and intro the movie. Jesus at like the uh, arc light Jesus. and go from theater to theater with the accompanying like, hey everybody, what? You know, <laughs> hope you like it and then just get out of there. And because we wanted to feel, sure. why should, why just because it's a movie, why don't you get to experience that? Right. You know, um, and That's, sometimes you can sitting in the back of the theater with people laughing. If yeah. it's a comedy, if sure. it's a drama, not so much. But so much of it is you put that message in a bottle and it's gone, you never even get to see them read it. Yeah. But that's changing with Twitter and with you know, the online interaction, the, the g people out there are getting voices and, and a collection of voices that then speak back. Right. And so there's a dialogue beginning. And so it might not be like a stand-up or, or Broadway, but there is a call and response to, to it that never was there yeah. before. It used to be an auteur and maybe a few reviewers would tell you what it is. And then box office began to be measured in a way that was a metric for success, but that wasn't the case when we were growing up. You no. didn't even know what anything made. No. I remember I said that, you know, Bla you know uh, that, that, that Harrison Ford still feel, gets a lump from the mention of Blade Runner, like that wasn't a successful endeavor. And to me was one of the most formative yeah. two hours of my life. But he has a sense of memory somewhere that That's someone right. told him it didn't yeah, perform it at the box office. It didn't come out or didn't get a good review. Who knows what it was? I was so oblivious to it. I just remember being an usher in the movie theater with Indiana Jones 2 playing. That's how I know him, you know, uh, in high school. Or, or uh, J Jedi, I think, was in the theater when I, was, when I was started working at the RKO Keiths in Flushing. So my relationship to movies was it's the magic land that I got to go to. Yeah. But you talk to those people like Steiger talking about on the waterfront, and his memory is what the script supervisor was saying. Right. You know, and, it's, and that's sort of the sad part is that as we sort of graduate to that level, we no longer get the magic of what Oz is doing for the crowd. Oh, we're, no, of we're course. behind the curtain. Did, did you, was it, so is it, a, does it take you a few days, weeks, months to decompress when a movie opens and either overperforms or underperforms? Oh, yeah. Sure. It has to. Oh, it's... Because you have no perspective. Either way, it's devastating. Right. Like, people don't get that. But it's almost scarier when it's doing well. Because yeah. it feels like this looming... Like, this, like everything went out of balance, and now one's the other shoe going to fall. Something, right. you know... And I actually, now, when I see somebody experiencing extreme success, I feel more sympathy for them than the ones that, where their thing isn't doing well. Because right. I know what a scary ride that is too, to be able to understand and, and, and adjust to. What I like is a nice, slow, steady climb with a few little bumps so you go up and down. Which is probably how you feel about it thus far. I've had a few moments where it was like wham. Right. And those were always the most stressful. Uh, and then I've had a few where it drops, but at least that's kind of like, of course it did, you know. Of course the third didn't do well, you know what I mean? Of course, uh, 
I didn't, they didn't like what I had to say. Well, yeah, but uh, boy, oh boy. This sort of an, this sort of an expected works. failure, I don't know, I'm more accepting of failure than I am of, of great, uh, of, of success that's more than I expect. Right. But, but uh, ultimately, you wrap your head around it, but again, through usually. But there's a sadness, though, when you hear it, uh, Harrison Ford get a lump over Blade Runner. Is, for me, there was a sadness when you mentioned yeah. that because everyone else, literally everyone else, yeah. just considers it a classic. Yeah, and I think he's come to accept that as well. Right. Um, but it's when you're front row, it's different. When you're driving the airplane, it's a different experience than when you're up. A passenger in the back it's just a different thing right and, and, it, and well it, that's my question to you when yeah. you taste the level of glory yeah that you found more unnerving yeah of that spike it, it, it's it, yeah unnerving is a good a good a good word so when you've tasted that yeah um, the, the, the organically has to be a part of you that is um, never confident but wishful for a, a version of that every time you go to the plate you know it's not possible. I don't feel that way, honestly, sincerely. You don't want to ever feel like your best, your best work was behind you. Right. Uh, that's a fear, but that becomes more about being brave than being safe. Right. Uh, and the you only wanna, way is to be brave. I, I, I think so. I think I think that's the thing. Um, if if Iron Man is the movie that makes the most money of any movie I've ever made, or Iron Man Two, uh, I'm very that's. Ha, Please, that's I'm blessed. Uh, it, it's afforded me freedom to connect with people, to get kids thinking it's cool to study science, um, to have a hero that exemplifies second chances, and that the rise of the hero isn't always the kid who's coming up out of you know from from youth into adulthood, but it's also an adult that has maybe wavered and rededicated themselves to something, uh, uh, to a higher cause, right? Yeah, so to know that that energy's out in the universe and, and uh, we're presenting our society as something that's complex and has humanity and humor, uh, as an ambassador through this work or a small piece of it, I like that that's a face that we're showing uh, people who are learning about us other than what we do through, um, you know, just through politicians or, right. I like that they're seeing sort of peeling back who we are and people are seeing us for who we are and, and Robert's a guy that shows you, that's, that's a billionaire, you know, he's flawed and he's broken and he's self-conscious and he's worried and, right. but yet he's brave and, and so I, I like that. Um, but when you put as much heart and soul effort and the same amount of energy and your life force into Cowboys and Aliens yes. that you did as Iron yeah, Man, yeah. with all the Iron Man histrionics. Yeah. Sure. And and it doesn't rise to the same level. No, no, yeah. But you know you did something you're incredibly proud of. I think I think it takes time right. to you figure that out. Like, like Made wasn't Made now is a movie that not a lot of people saw necessarily, but it's the one that has hung tight and tough and people come to me. So I guess what, what I'm learning now and, and, and what the, this information age affords us is the people, as long as people feel strongly when they do like it, like I don't have to connect with everybody, right. but those people over time find their way to something. Right. And, it, and, it, and it floats there and it, it, it keeps it relevant over time. No question. So Rudy was a, was a failure at the box office. But which is astounding. But has now floated through our culture and become a staple on television and people come to me and say, oh my God, I showed it to my class. I showed it to my team. Like those are the things that give me the, 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 the bumps now. Um, and I've been in movies that have won at the box office that haven't, haven't really ma maintained relevance. But I'm, I think if you invest enough in your, in your work and in the people in your family and the people in your circle of friends and keep everything on a human scale, even though the world is so big when you're playing at that table, keep it as small and as human as you can and make sure that you're connecting with the part of you that you're learning from, um, then I think you're, you're going to be... It's so much of success and failure is your interpretation. And so what I work on more is, is how I, the context with which I view the world, not so much with, you want to do well and learn your craft well, but more of it has to do with what your disposition is. I could argue both sides of the case that, 
that I'm a great success or a great failure at any given moment on any given project. So it becomes a choice. And right. I don't think it's just us. I think it's everybody. I right. think that's part of the human condition. You've got to take incredible solace in knowing that you left everything on the court. Right? When, when you do. Yeah. When you do. Right. Sometimes you don't feel that way. Sometimes you feel like you've you made compromises when you shouldn't have. It's tough to look back. I mean, you could kind of look back later, wow. but you're really looking at a, you know, something that went, this forensic thing doesn't help that much. No, uh, it, it, no, it really doesn't. Because if you're looking for uh, a lesson and an education that we talked about comes more from failure than success, then you're going to find in, in your forensic work yeah. Decisions were made for the right reasons at the time. Yeah, yeah. As long as you're doing that, like, yeah. and you can't, and you have to also look at it's the each premier to box office is seen as as a, as this uh, to, this this me, this metric, but really, I, I did a Q and A at the DGA um, with James Cameron, and so I looked at all of his work, and the most interesting thing was was the Abyss, mm. because the Abyss was not financially successful. No. But if you look at the abyss, it was like I was saying about Freaks and Geeks also, if you look at Freaks and Geeks, you see the continuum into all the judge work, into Paul Feig's work, the, all the actors work. If you look at the abyss, you could see when he was working through the ideas for Titanic and working through the ideas Terminator. For, for Terminator and the technology, the technology and then even into Avatar. Yeah. So how do you separate the, 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 the pupa from the butterfly? Right, you, in 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 looking back in in history, you could it it's all feels like one flow, uh, dealing with archetypes, character types, dialogue, story structure. So much of of aliens aliens was in abyss with, and and so much of of Avatar was in aliens. If you look at there are certain repeating, and it's like looking at the sculptors working. You know, Michelangelo. You look there are hunks of. There are hunks of, uh, of marble that have just a hand, just a face, as he's working out how to make the pieta. Right. You know? So I think the best thing you could do is just bring your A game, don't get in your own way, and just do your thing. Uh, and, then, and then when you don't have, when you're laying in bed and can't do anything, look back and try to figure out what it was. And you're probably not gonna wanna look back at it at that point either. Let that be for other people. The best you could do is leave it on the field, bust your ass, do things that challenge you, that you're curious about, things that scare you, and things that connect to you and make you make your hair stand up. Yeah. When you connect that you feel an emotional swell, right. when you write a line of dialogue, or you uh, imagine how a scene's gonna take place, or a piece of music that you're gonna use that you hear in the car, run to that and run away from that which makes you cringe, yeah. which is Larry David's thing. I, Larry Charles I, I worked with, and he said Larry David's whole thing is, the things that make you cringe don't do that. And that's your only divining rod when you're in the editing room or trying to work out something creatively. Because right. that's the only thing you can count on is that cringe reflex. If it makes you cringe, stay away and then play over here. And you know, uh, it, there's a, I think they all share the common thing of it's, it's an experiential thing and it's a process thing and not a product thing or a self-judgment thing. Um, that's where I'm at now. That's where I'm at, at now. Uh, I don't. I don't know more than that. <laughs> Sorry. Well, uh, yeah. first of all, thank you for all of that. Um, you know, I, I I mentioned something at the top of doing this uh, pilot, Beverly Hills Cop, and the truth of the matter is, I'm unbelievably excited. And at the same token, I know that being a pilot, being in that structure of we do this and then it becomes that. Mm -hmm. I'm just a gun for hire. There's so little control over anything other than my own performance, and even that's going to be mm -hmm. uh, perfected or ruined in editing. So, but you trust Barry. I mean, that's 100 so much. And, and Sean yeah. Ryan. I mean, his pedigree yeah, with the great. Shield and everything. He's extraordinary talent. A great dude. This is what I'm excited about. Actually, yeah. is yeah. the pedigree behind the project. Yes. Uh, let alone the fact that Eddie's involved as well. Uh, there's certain expectations, which is always the root of disappointment. Right. So you get to a place of Let's just do the best work we can. Yes. In television especially, yes. it's almost a lottery to get the right time slot, to get the right sure. lead in, to sure. get all those elements lined up. And so the same thing has to be said about giant box office sure. movies. For sure. Marketing. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What else is what else is out? 
you have to, other people have to stumble and you have to have your top. There's a zeitgeist that's happening at the yes. exact, exact moment in yes, time where right. we're ready for Robert Downey to that's come right. back and right. blossom in it's such like a Oz. way. Oz now is just like, there was a moment and it happened. Right. And it just happens and you can't force it when it's not and it's there when it is and you just say thank you or yeah. we'll get him next time. And you can't play, you can't, it's like, it's like you can't time the market. You no. can't do, just do, do it, do it. And you know, it's like poker, right? Yes. It's a game of chance, but yet the same people end up at the final table quite often. And the reason it's a game of skill is that you want to get your money in correctly. And that's what that's I meant right. about, you that's did right. the best you could in that moment. That's right. Yeah. I play, and, and by the way, poker tournaments are a good example. Here's, yeah. uh, if I bust out with the nuts, you know, or think I had the best hand, and I suck out, the other guy sucks out on the river or something, but I had the best odds going into that all in, in right. I never feel bad no. when I lose. No. I never, yeah. but when I play bad right. and I lose, I, I, that's when I'm chewing through my lip in the car. And when I win by making a bad call, I don't ever have the, I never enjoy it as much. It's a shallow victory for sure. But I, lo I know, and because the p other people know when you're doing it with the right, you know, if you push in and you had, you know, you had the right hand and you yeah. had the odds and they and you got them the call with the lower odds you won I, I don't know if you saw or heard me talk about but the last main event I went all the way to the end of day five and it was the oh for the World Series World Series oh main my event God. First, like? first time in it was first insane. time in first time playing the main event and now you put your own 10 grand or whatever it is on the table oh, of course not okay. I had a sponsor okay good. Hollywood poker <laughs> love nice. them very very nice. much nice but I went I lasted to 134th out of Five thousand, six thousand five. Oh, were you, was that in the money? Six thousand six hundred, well into the money. Wow. I don't remember the exact number, fifty-two thousand seven hundred eighteen. <laughs> but here's the, That's amazing. the 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 thing is about getting your money in right. And uh, at that point, my mind is really locked on. At the end of this, there's going to be two conversations. How far did you get? What did you go out on? And I just wanted the what did you go out on to be not overplaying yes. ace jack not being some right, sort of right. mistake. And when I went out, it was queens against queens, and he four-flushed on the board. But you both had you both, we both had, had pair queens. queens. Okay, but so four hearts came out, and he took Okay, them. but that, to so, me, that's, that part of the story is not even as interesting as what you got him to call you at. But, but the great part of that is everyone's response is, oh, you poor fuck. No, no. And to me, it was the perfect exit, because now all I get is empathy. Yeah. No one will ever say, what were you thinking? You're yes. an idiot. Who was who? Were you against the pro or was it against? No. The, oh, but I anybody who's still in it at that point. Yeah. I mean, I had just uh, felt at Daniel Negreanu at the main feature table, which uh, was like beating uh, your dad in the driveway uh, of basketball. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Ridiculous. But that feeling of I got it all in right. Yes. It came around to it. me. I was a little short that's, stack. You have to, that's a great life lesson, yeah. and that's what's great about poker is that there you can separate the two things, and yeah. you do understand that although you're you're putting yourself in a position to succeed, right? And that, that's right. all you have control over. And if the system breaks apart, uh, if the souffle does not rise, right. if the people don't show up when you open the door, you can't control those things. And so you have to learn to control to to, to concentrate on the things you can control. And yeah. it's amazing how much that will affect the odds and your outcome. Yeah. But if you start getting mad that you flipped the tail instead of a head, what are you beating yourself up That's over? That's crazy, crazy. I, know, I, I have no patience for that sort of thing either, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, thank you so very much for the yes. last two hours. Unfucking believable. I hope it was worth the wait. Oh, God. Oh, I please. I should be fun. And uh, thank yeah. you for all your, you know, um, as you could see, you, you've influenced my life in many, many ways along, along the way and, um, and, uh, and your performances as a, as a fan as well. But very proud of what you're doing here. Thank you. And you do it well. And I love that even without an obvious endpoint to what the goal is, right. you are diving into it and bringing great guests and great conversations and trying to find a way to spread it. And yeah. I think only in looking back will people understand how important all of this type of work is right well, now. Well, thank you, honestly. Uh, in the very beginning, there was, it was all, how are you going to monetize, how are you going to monetize? Yeah. And the truth is, we celebrate four years in a couple of weeks on March 22nd, yeah. and we just now found this wonderful home with Earwolf, the great great, great pop comedy podcast of well, all time. Well, good for them for, for supporting this, because it's uh, this, but, is, but this it's, is a great learning experience. For, yeah. I wish I, you know what I mean? 
you, where do you hear this type of stuff? Not for everybody, but right. for the people who care. The people who care. Who care. That's there's right. some place to go and, and like you were saying, you cherry pick. You go down the menu, you go, I want right. to know what the fuck Eddie Izzard right. talked about for two and a half hours. They're like, oh, that's not the speech writer. And they click off. On the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John, thank you yeah, so very yeah. much. Yeah. Please sit there uncomfortably for 90 seconds while sure. I wrap things up. My pleasure. For uh, everybody at home watching us live on the YouTube. Uh, if you're joining us on the air, well, thank you so much. Write to us a contact at kevinpollockschatshow.com. Let us know what you think about every damn thing about the uh, show. They're putting up on the screen that I can't let you slide out of here with your own Larry King game. I don't know if you made it to the end of any of these. I have. Okay. <laughs> What's the formula? Uh, I'm going to give you the three rules. Okay. Uh, uh, it's that bumper that we'd see Larry do before he'd go to the yes. phone. He'd share something Still about Larry? himself. Oh, yeah. It's like Nixon jokes at this point, isn't it? <laughs> no. He's got a big show on Hulu. Oh, he does now. Okay. Yeah, you have to do it, okay, actually. Good. It's uh, also jury duty. But um, it's the, he, he would share something about himself and then go to yeah. the phone. And it was always something no one needed to know. Yes. Right? Whether it was his first ride on a pterodactyl, whatever yes, it is. Yes, yes. So you're Larry. You're not sharing. And anything. then he throws. And then he throws to the phone. And the name of the city should be funny. Okay. Something. Okay. There's your camera. When you're ready, okay. have at it. This is Larry. I got to do it. Yeah, 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 this go. is Larry. Yeah. This is Larry King. Uh -huh. 1983, the Black Hills of South Dakota. I was in the back of Billy Idol's Harley Davidson. Bold Angle, Kentucky, you're on the air. <laughs> that, my friends, yeah. is hitting it out of the park yes. at the first swing. I was slow playing you there. I, yeah, yeah, I, I you thought, were. I thought about it in the car. <laughs> oh, God. I thought about it in the car. That's my favorite. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. Thank you. All right, cheers. All right. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Chen. Nice to have you back. Sammy, Jamie. Great as always. Hope uh, we'll we'll talk about the YouTube experience and uh, gather our notes. Uh, Justin, Josh, and Jason in the outer circle and Samantha on makeup once again. Elaine Ewing doing the fantastic job. Social media. We're clocking this one at two hours, eight minutes, fifteen seconds. Until next time, and as always, get the fuck out of my face.